Okay. Um, so I will uh, call the November 4th, uh, 2021 meeting of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission to order. It is 9.01. And we will start with a um, roll call. Commissioner Bertrand? Present. Commissioner Brown? Here. Commission Alternate Schifrin? Here. Commissioner Alternate uh, Hearst? I'm here. Commissioner Caput? Here. Commissioner Johnson? Here. Commissioner Friend? Don't see. Pointer Friend. It's alternates here. Oh, Commissioner Alternate Quinn? Oh, I guess not. Wow. Commissioner Koenig? Here. Commissioner McPherson? Commissioner Peterson? Present. Commissioner Northcutt? Here. And Commissioner Alternate Pegler? Here. It okay. looks like we just uh, we just uh, got Commissioner Montesino here, so I'll take off Commissioner Hurst. Okay. All right. So we will now move on to oral communications. At this time, any member of the public may address the commission on any item within the jurisdiction of the commission that is not already on the agenda. The commission will listen to all communications um, and in compliance with state law, it's worth remembering that um, uh, we will not take any action on these items today. <clears throat> Speakers are um, will be given uh, two minutes, actually two minutes for oral communications today. I think we may have uh, a few uh, folks who want to speak to us. So um, let's go ahead and do two minutes for oral communications. Sorry about that, Yesenia. That's okay. We're give us a, just one second here to get it all set up. Okay. Again, this is going to be for items not on our agenda. We do have uh, an item, uh, item number nineteen, which is uh, intended for discussion of the TIG M proposal, uh, and so I, I just want to. Um, make sure that that folks know that that is on our agenda for later. If you want to talk about the Coast Futura demonstration or things like that, um, you can talk about those during oral communications, but we will specifically be talking about um, that proposal uh, during our regular business. So please uh, you reserve your, your oral communications for con items not on our agenda. And we will begin now. I'm looking at participants. I see eight hands raised and um, Yesenia, would you mind? Sure. Uh, Ms. Folks? Judy Gittleson. Thank you. So Judy, you're up. Good morning, commissioners. I've read you my train poems and now I have rode. I was a yes before and now I'm sold. I've said it before and I'll say it again, the train being here, it's a win, win, win. Zero emissions, zero emissions, zero emissions, wow. It was quiet and pleasant, the views were beyond. I just wish the train was still here, that the train wasn't gone. California designed and manufactured, what's not to like? You are the guys who can install the first spike. This can be done with delight, without fear, a few years to build, 350 million. It's relatively cheap and the future is here. It could be running and we could boast. Come see what we've done here on our coast. The public will love you. The county will shine. The earth will be happy. The children will whine. I want to ride. I want to ride. Zero emissions. Zero emissions. Zero emissions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kerry Pico and then Kaki Rusmore. I have a PowerPoint presentation. Yesenia, can you bring it up? Yes. Uh, 
Thank you. I'm going to be very short. It's to the point. I've always said this for the last since I've been involved, no public subsidies for private for-profit businesses. Next slide, please. No, with my, did I click it? I can't seem to, there it is. Just give me one second, Terry. You okay. can just click the, oh, yes. there we go. So from the 2011 plan, the current plan for the Santa Cruz County, Santa Cruz branch rail line is to establish rail recreational rail service. Recreational rail service is designed to be self-sustaining and not require public subsidy. And there's a source for you. Next slide. There you go. Those are the subsidies, the first two. You've done $9 million under Iowa Pacific, $13.5 million under Progressive, these numbers come from the RTC fiscal audits that are published online. And unfortunately for the 2022 or 21, I, uh, actually I used up to 22. Those are only budgets because you haven't published your fiscal audits. If you do the Davenport to Santa Cruz, that's 15.3 million. That comes from the UCIS study. And if you do a class one upgrade all the way between Santa Cruz and Watsonville, that's another $47 million. My point is, this is for for-profit private businesses. It is not for the public use. Please stop subsidizing for-profit businesses. Thank you. Kathy Westmore. Kaki, you're on mute. Thank you. Okay, here we go. Good morning. Um, let me see. I, I don't know how to make myself visible, so I guess I won't worry about that. Um, so thank you, and I appreciate your time, and I appreciate all the work that the RTC is putting into thinking about our public rail corridor. Um, I'm just going to remind you a few things that your own staff studies have shown that the using the quarter for public transit is the best option for its use and that the best option studied by your by your staff is for some sort of light rail passenger service. I want to make sure that we keep that in mind and that we make sure that the plan that is already in place provides for rail pedestrian and bicycle transit. I think it's really important that we keep our options open and do not pave over the existing rail line. As you probably know, there is no there is no community in this in the entire country that has done rail banking and gone back to putting in light rail. We've seen that this is the best option for our community. I think we need to go forward with it. I took the bus from Aptos to Watsonville last week took me an hour and 15 minutes on the express from Cap from Cabrillo College. That is not a viable option. So we need to make sure that we have an affordable option. We're now looking at affordable options. We need to make sure that those are important. This is important not only for an equity matter in our community, but for the economic development. The studies have shown that it would do that and also for our environment. We've got COP26 going on right now showing us that we have to do much, much more if we don't want to have a climate catastrophe. And so I really hope that the RTC is not swayed by people with money and uses the best thinking to go forward. Thank you so much. Next, we have equity and environment, then Mark Johansson. Good morning. My name is Lonnie Faulkner, and I deeply appreciate the Regional Transportation Commission and Guy Preston for providing the license to run the Coast Futura light rail demo. The event was incredibly successful, with large numbers of the community showing up in hopes of getting a ticket after initial tickets were reserved within a few short hours. And on the last day of the event, as stormy 40 plus mile per hour winds and rain increased, more people kept coming to ride the train and every ride was full to capacity. 
Many more people have since expressed their desire to have more demos, and more importantly, so many of us want to see regular public rail service in the near future that can eventually extend all the way to Watsonville. This demo was an important step towards honoring the 1990 Santa Cruz majority vote in favor of Proposition 116, which allowed us to purchase the Santa Cruz branch line, and I quote from the acquisition contract, for the purpose of preserving the rail corridor for future multimodal uses, including continuation of existing freight and recreational rail service, end quote, using funds acquired through the Clean Air and Transportation Improvement Act, designating funds primarily for passenger rail capital projects. Our community's significant efforts to bring passenger rail to this county have been commended by the state of California and are in line with CAPTI, which indicates connecting cities across the state of California by a rail and transit network is a top priority for mitigating climate change. Our community has long awaited passenger rail service between Santa Cruz and Watsonville, which would eventually connect us to the state rail network, including Monterey, currently developing their rail system in a phased approach. Thanks again to the RTC and Guy Preston for helping us move forward with this important step in bringing a robust, equitable, and environmentally smart rail transit to our community. Thank you. Mark Johansson, then Saldine Sale. Uh, good morning. My name is Mark Johannesson, and I'm a resident of Aptos, and I'm here representing TIGAM on the recent demonstration of a streetcar on the Santa Cruz branch line. Uh, TIGAM would like to thank the commission and staff for allowing us to demonstrate our clean air, battery-operated hydrogen fuel cell tram during the Coast for Tour event on the Santa Cruz branch line. The demonstration was extremely successful. Uh, tickets for both locations were fully booked within four hours for Santa Cruz and within six hours for Watsonville. And then over the seven dates, we carried slightly more than 1,900 passengers between Watsonville and the Harkins Slough and between the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk and the Capitola Overlook. From the passengers on board to the operations ground and flighters crew, there was not a single major incident. And the public response by those observing the streetcar along the route, route was overwhelmingly supportive with many stop and ask questions and give comments regarding the continuation of this type of service. The entire Coast for Tour crew truly appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Hey, we have um, Saladin Sale and then David, Public Transit. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Saladin Sale, county resident for over 50 years. I'm an enthusiastic supporter of light rail transit alongside our rail trail. The recent demonstrations of the TIGAN battery fuel cell streetcar provided compelling evidence of new technology that disproves the notion that rail transit means loud, dirty, expensive, locomotive-driven trains. The fact that our rail line accommodated a clean, quiet electric streetcar over a two-week period with only minimal tune-up work on the line suggests we're closer than one might think to being able to begin limited range service. It seems to me that a self-powered light rail tram carrying passengers, bikes, and wheelchairs between Capitola and Santa Cruz or Davenport would be a powerful generator of public support for further expansion. I find it regrettable that we're again widening our freeway while our unused rail corridor begs the addition of clean electric streetcars alongside the rail trail. Far better, in my opinion, would be investments in bringing the tracks back up to full operational status, incrementally if necessary, fully funding and constructing the entire rail system before beginning any service can't be the only approach. All parts of our transit system will inevitably grow over time why not recognize this now and seriously look at beginning light rail with something smaller initially? I want both rail trail and light rail transit as soon as possible. For now, I urge the commission to direct staff to put maximum effort into expanding our rail trail. Yeah, and um, I don't know if you know, but the RTC meeting is on. Oh, you are, okay. For initial implementation of self-powered multi-unit electric streetcars as the backbone 
of our evolving public transit system. Thank you. Uh, David, public transit, then, and then Katie Freeman. Uh, hello, can you hear me all right? Yes. Hi, I, I'm David Van Brink, and yes, I, I do love public transit. Uh, uh, good morning, commissioners and RTC members. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm going to talk about that thing. I know you work on other important things, too. So first of all, thank you all for facilitating the light rail demo. Uh, we hope there can be more things like that in the future to help excite and visionize the public. Um, so, you know, word gets around. I heard that some RTC staff were <clears throat> displeased by the Coast Futura presentation, and I, I can't imagine why. I mean, I, I hate it when I see my profession in the movies totally misrepresented. Um, I hope we can still see the bigger picture, though. Members of the public had an experience fully suggestive of the preferred alternative in all relevant respects. And yes, the Coast Futura narrated a rather optimistic implementation scenario. But the takeaway is that the public understands the experience and the premise, and, and they support it. That's what they're going to remember. Now, we already know the public supports rail. We knew it in 1990 with Prop 116. We knew it in 2011 when we purchased the branch line. And you know we know it today. It's it's reflected in the preferred alternative. So you know, please take take the big picture. Public transit, rail transit is a winner. The public likes it. You know, you're covered. You can and should move forward. Thanks. Katie Freeman and then uh, Tina Andre Andretti Andreate. <laughs> Hi, I'd like to thank the RTC, Roaring Camp, TIG M, the community supporters and volunteers that came out to um, provide the opportunity for the public to see the demonstration of the um, Coast Futura. I was able to ride on the Watsonville leg of the um, excursion, and it was really incredible. There was a lot of positive support that I found on the ride that I took and experiencing the technology in person of the rail car and seeing the possibilities that were available um, in the near future for our county was just incredible. I'm excited to see this type of public transit come to our county to connect North County and South County and provide clean and equitable transportation to all of us. Thank you again for the RTC and I hope you continue to explore this possibility with all of your energy. Thank you. Tina, Andriata, and then Miles. Tina, you're muted. Tina, we, we can't hear you, you're on mute. Should we come back to Tina? Sure. Okay. Uh, next is Miles. Good morning. Uh, I want to thank you for your work and all that you do. Uh, and I want to thank you for allowing the Coach Futura demo. My wife, granddaughters, and I loved it. <clears throat> we are looking forward to more options and eventually a real local train. Bike paths are good things. I hope to see a nice one alongside our beautiful electric train. As a conservationist, I am disheartened by any plan to remove the tracks. The human and material capital that created this incredible structure has real lasting value. Rail banking is turning a built resource into junk that will never be used as well as it is now. Uh, even if it's recycled. Please do not throw away all that beautiful wood, ballast, steel, and the ongoing benefits of all the labor and industry that created it. I've been hiking along those tracks for over 30 years, from Davenport to Watsonville, but never all at once, of course. <laughs> I'm getting older and look forward to a time when I may not be able to walk as well, when I can get on a train and go to the places I love but I am not wanting to have the train for me. I'm not wanting the train for all the tourist dollars it will bring into our communities. I want the train 
for all the people who will use it as an alternative to cars to get to work, visit family and friends, and go shopping. Thank you. Please pursue the trail, the rail trail with all your energies. Thank you. Lawrence Kaplan. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Good, thank you. This is regarding the TIGM proposal. I've been to Disneyland. Lawrence, Lawrence I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we do have the TIGM proposal on our regular business agenda. It's item 19. So if you want to speak specifically to that proposal, uh, that would be the time. Thank you. Then I'll wait. Thanks. Anne Kaplan. Just hit. And you're on mute. There you go. Good morning. And I'm sorry, I will need to wait until uh, item 19 is, is approached as well. Okay. Uh, Sally Arnold. Hi, am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Uh -oh. Yes, Sally. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so I wanted to also thank the commission and the staff for their support of the Coast Futura demo. Granting the license for this demonstration allowed the county to see one example of what future rail transit could look like. I also want to thank Roaring Camp and TIGAM who worked closely on pulling off this important community event. The demonstration had 68 runs taking almost 2,000 passengers, over 400 miles over two weekends, and over 100 community volunteers worked to help make this event a success. The demonstration just grew in popularity over the two weekends as more and more people saw the streetcar move quietly through their neighborhoods alongside the rail trail. They came to the boarding area so they could ride themselves. And to uh, everybody's surprise, that very last stormy Sunday was the most fully booked, uh, you know, longest waiting lines uh, of all. The demonstration also provided a proof of concept of what car-free commuting could look like, which is an important step in our discussions about transportation equity for the commuters who are getting to work by car right now. Tra implementation of a zero emission streetcar such as the Coast Futura could enable, would help us fight against climate change since it can be recharged with clean energy sourced from our local so Central Coast community energy. And if you've been looking at social media, you may have seen some of the great quotes. I'm gonna just share a couple. Over the last couple of days, we've been able to ride and watch the, tr the demo train cruise the boardwalk in Capitola and back. We were incredibly pressed with all the passion, education, good energy, and overall community building vibe that the leaders of Coast Futura displayed. That's by Capitola resident Joe Downey. Um, uh, Aaron Bistron of Santa Cruz shared on Instagram, what an amazing way to see Santa Cruz. Pretty stoked to see some alternative clean energy transportation. Anyway, I just want to thank the staff and the commissioners for helping to make this happen. And I hope we see more similar demonstrations soon with other vehicles. Io Kelly and then Jack Brown. Hey all, thank you so much. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, I, I want to thank commission and staff for uh, granting the license to to run the Coast Futura demo, uh, both, both uh, you know, on that this uh, like two weekends ago and the weekend before that, both in Watsonville and Santa Cruz, uh, it was a delight to see all the people that came out uh, to come and ride and see what it would look like to to run trains. And I want to I want to point out something about kind of the future of public transit and our ability to do it is to do a cost comparison. You know, if people want to talk about just this rail corridor. You know, not talking about the highway, the estimated cost for a single new freeway interchange at 41st Avenue was about $100 million. Just, just one interchange, and that's just for private vehicles, right? Public transit helps us go much further per dollar um, than private vehicles will. It's a big cost for, for both the people that have to drive through it all, um, and it's a big cost to the RTZ. So I hope you look to what's going to scale what's going to help us be able to develop appropriately because we're going to have to do housing. The state's going to require it. Um, and the big question you should all be thinking about is do we want people coming in by car or do we want them coming in by rail? Because people are going to keep coming. So we should accommodate them with a rail line that connects us back to the state rail plan. And it costs us a lot less money than expanding the highway, adding new interchanges. 
Thank you. Mr. Jack Brown and then Michael Wolf. Hi, I wanted to talk about the uh, Costa Futura demonstration. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that neither the RTC nor the city of Watsonville sponsored this event. This was a private event that was just licensed by the RTC. Um, as far as the uh, quick sellout, that was more of a, a fake demand by limiting the number of pre-reserved items and requiring people to put in their credit card numbers um, to uh, reserve a spot. Um, there was actually quite a few requests by Friends of the Rail Trail to get people to start joining because there were a lot of empty trains in the afternoon. So uh, a bit of false demand and publicity stunts you know, going on around this. Um, a couple other things that we saw was uh, some a group of people who were opposed to the demonstration showed up to see uh, Supervisor Koenig uh, give a presentation after they left. The Fort members that were actually directors of Fort actually were assaulting and uh, uh, verbally abusing people that were opposed to the, uh, the public event and forced them off the property. Um, it was very uncivil behavior at that point. Um, but I think what we need to understand here is that what was demonstrated is not reality. Um, in 16 years of TIGM's existence, they've only done 10 implementations of that. Seven of them have already been scrapped. And their record of operating speeds, durations, um, have been significantly just a fraction of what would be required for public transit in Santa Cruz. So we can do better than this, guys. Um, let's uh, really look into fuss on shoulder and making a greenway out of what is an unused corridor uh, that's just been held hostage for far too long. Uh, appreciate, we'll, we'll have more comments during uh, agenda item 19. Thank you. Michael Wool and Sean. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, so I'd just like to thank you guys for um, allowing the Coast Futura event to happen. I'm a student at UCSC and an avid transit rider, as all of us are at UCSC. We make up the large majority of transit riders in the county. And after doing a lot of community outreach to UCSC over the past few months, it is overwhelm it is there's an overwhelming interest in rail transit for students because we ride transit more than anyone else in this county and have a very limited scope of the county that we live in and pay taxes in and go to school in. So having, seeing a train going down that corridor for a lot of students was kind of this reality check that, wow, this really could happen a lot sooner if there was political will. And I just hope that people see, people see this demonstration and see like, yeah, this could happen sooner if you know the political will was there. Um, aside from that, I volunteered at Coast Futura for about eight hours at 41st Avenue, and the community response was overwhelmingly positive. Just seeing you know residents of various backgrounds and age groups come around and see the train and just be really excited to see a train on our corridor was kind of amazing. And yeah, it was overwhelmingly positive. So I hope you guys can take this and get this done because, you know, we're not, you know, the climate crisis is happening now. Students can't get around this county if they're not on the bus line. And let's like build a better transportation system. Thank you. Sean and then Robert Arco. Good morning. I'm going to read um, a letter from Foster Anderson. He's the executive director and founder of Shared Adventures. I was able to ride in Watsonville and Santa Cruz, and I felt even more confident about the light rail streetcar because of its zero footprint, generating its own energy using solar panels and state-of-the-art batteries down below. I was amazed at how quiet it was inside. And given proper tracks, the light, the light rail can exceed speeds up to 50 miles an hour. The best part was how happy everyone on the train was. And for people with special needs like myself, using my power wheelchair, transportation is limited and the train can open up to meet a huge need for more accessible transportation. 
Foster Anderson. Worried about Foster. Foster wasn't born. Um, wasn't born here. He grew up on the East Coast. And after a devastating motorcycle accident, he chose Santa Cruz to move to and develop his nonprofit Shared Adventures. It's the most. It's the most uh, networked, well connected, uh, and I'd say popular local nonprofit um, that works uh, for the benefits of the disabled community. Um, during the pandemic, it's only received even um, it's received. Uh, more recognition and awards uh, than it usually does because of its uh, uh, because of its success. Um, he's been uh, he's been running this thirty years, and um, I don't think anybody um, is as well connected to the disabled community, uh, being as he his organization ended up more or less being the default for the county for about twenty years. I don't think anybody else is as well connected with the um, uh, disabled and special needs community. Um, and another thing he liked about these cars is that each one can uh, uh, can take two wheelchairs and uh, lash them down to the deck. Thank you. Robert Arco and Jessica Evans. Good morning, commissioners. Thanks for your work providing the license and your collaboration with Roaring Camp. Railroads, TIGAM, and the many volunteers made Coast for Sure demonstration happen in Watsonville and Santa Cruz. This proof of concept brought to life the vision for the rail and trail it was initiated 20 years ago and showed the community that modern clean transportation is viable, complementing the planned trail. We hope you can move beyond your current paralysis and proceed with a business plan for your preferred alternative of light rail and trail on the corridor. Please find a way to move forward incrementally, just like the trail plan, step by step. And let's strive to do something meaningful to transform our transportation solution into an equitable, scalable, systemic solution. And most important, to positively impact climate change. Thank you. Jessica Evans and then Michael Saint. Good morning, commissioners. Thank you so much for uh, allowing this public comment period. Um, this is, I, I'd just like to say thank you to to the commissioners for approving the, the demonstration. Uh, it was really a great community event. Um, and I'd also like to say thank you to the RTC staff because I know it wasn't easy to get these tracks up to the point where they could be permitted and a lot of, you know, people had to work on that project. Um, and it was really wonderful. It was really wonderful for the community to be able to see the possibilities um, and to see an example of the kind of vehicle that is in the transit corridor alternatives analysis, you know, preferred, uh, the preferred vehicle that that study came out with at the end. Um, so, you know, clean and quiet and electric vehicles, that's what called for and um, despite, you know, various, you know, PR campaigns saying, oh, you know, diesel and, and steam locomotives rampaging through our neighborhood. It's like this, this was a way to clear the air, literally, of the rhetoric and just let people see what, what the study was talking about and what the alternative was actually chosen uh, in the study. Um, so I would just, again, you know, I'm just here to say thank you and also to ask uh, the commission to um, consider scheduling reg regular demonstrations of the, you know, various different vehicles uh, that were identified um, as possibilities for our rail corridor. I'd love to see more. The public loved it. Uh, there was a huge amount of volunteers came out to make it happen. So, you know, that was pretty amazing to see the, you know, this upwelling of support. And we, I just, I just love to see more of the same. Thank you so much. Michael Saint and then Tina Andrietta. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Michael Saint with Campaign for Sustainable Transportation and also a Aptos resident. Uh, primarily, um, Campaign for Sustainable Transportation has not formed a consensus on what would be best for this corridor. 
but as an Aptos resident, uh, I've always remained somewhat neutral. But after taking the uh, trip on the TIG M, um, something really struck home with me. Uh, basically, I'm a, a senior, 70 years old, and still in relatively good health. And I'm capable, of course, riding a bike uh, those distances presently. But it just kept running over and over in my head that eventually time will catch up. We have a lot of seniors in the county. And um, I personally would like something like this on that corridor so I can continue to at least move my older body in those directions without having to ride a bike or, or even walk that far. Uh, so I'm somewhat becoming very supportive of some type of transportation on that corridor. Uh, whether it's the TIG M or not, um, doesn't matter a whole lot. I did like the size. It didn't seem overwhelming uh, or too extreme for that size of a corridor. Also like to comment on a comment by someone who said they took the bus from Cabrillo down to Watsonville, hour 15 minutes. Even with the new Oxlane projects and that hybrid bus on shoulder system or bus rapid transit, whatever you want to call it, that is still going to be an issue in the future. You will not increase or release the congestion in the future uh, if you're going to combine a bus with cars in that lane. Thank you for your time. Tina Andriata and then Ryan Sarnataro. Hear me? Yes. Finally, <laughs> thank you. Um, I uh, volunteered, and there were so many volunteers that came out. But I really want to. I want to thank the RTC for licensing the demo. But I really want us to talk about equity and Watsonville. Within 48 hours, the Spanish-speaking news channel had 40. Excuse me, 46,000 views. And currently, they have 48,700 views, over 600 likes, almost 300 shares. The comments are positive. 80% of the Boardwalk's employees live in, live in Watsonville. And I really think um, we need to keep the option open. We need to have uh, a public rail transit on the corridor. And I really urge everyone not to forget Watsonville. And during these conversations, it's, it's what I'm seeing, it's these small little areas and pockets of people living possibly like an Aptos or Live Oak, but no one's talking about Watsonville. We can't forget them. And as I stated, currently there's over 48,700 views. Thank you. Ryan, then Barry Scott. Ryan, you're on mute. Okay, hello. Yes, sorry about the delay there. Um, I actually wanted to get on the, uh, the little TIGM, but was uh, not able to. And I did watch it come down the tracks, and boy, did it look cute. And I watched it from 41st Street, and boy, did I see a lot of motorists stopped and rather unhappy. And the idea that that would happen to people 60 times a day along multiple major roads in our county uh, is really something that I think a transportation commission needs to take a look at. A lot of the comments here are devoid of context. They don't have all the relevant details. What will it really cost the public to be able to put the uh, the rail corridor in the condition that's required for this thing to run. How much will it cost going up and down? Will there be some kind of concessions that are required in terms of real estate in order for the TIG-M project to actually make a profit? The idea that the freeway expansion is not something that can facilitate transit when right now the major way that 
public transit operates is to go up and down the freeway uh, uh, to Watsonville, at least for the long distance. I, I think these kind of um, misconceptions need to be addressed by the RTC. I, I, do, I do understand that already the RTC is not uh, in favor of this particular project. But I think that better information in the hands of the public is going to make this discussion actually move beyond how cute and how enjoyable it would be to have something like this compared to how practical it is to actually implement it and what it will cost. Barry Scott and then Lawrence Kaplan. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, better information before the public. That's exactly what we experienced and I'm so happy. Uh, this goes out to Judy Gittleson and to the RTC briefly. Thank you. Judy's poem was magnificent. A great way to start today. I want to thank the RTC for permitting this demonstration. That's what an RTC should do. This is the first time in 25 years that we've had a demonstration of a modern rail vehicle. Back then in 1996, there were three one-day uh, presentations provided. Those happened to be diesel powered. The passengers we had included commissioners, Caltrans folks, Tamsi, mayors of King City, Carmel, other mayors. And what did we learn? We learned a lot. We got to test one of the six vehicles mentioned in the TCAA business plan. One of six, TIGM. We learned that our local railroad, Roaring Camp, wants to make this happen. We learned that we can use parts of the rail line today. We learned that we can offer regular all-day transit between two cities today. How do we know this? Because it happened. Hourly departures over several days between Santa Cruz and Capitola were provided by this demonstration. We should be thinking about a phased implementation starting as soon as possible, including that Capitola to the boardwalk stretch. So I thank you. I thank the commission. Please do the repairs that are needed and funded under Measure D. And to commissioners, please revisit and pass the rail transit business plan. Thank you. Lawrence Kaplan, then Anne Kaplan. If I could just quickly jump in here. Yes, Ania. Um, Lawrence and Anne, if you are still um, signed up to talk about the TIGAM proposal, item 19, that again is going to be later. Um, if you've changed your mind and you want to make an oral communication that's separate from that, um, now is the time. Otherwise, I think we want to go on to Rebecca Downing. It looks like that Lawrence and Ann both um, lowered their hands and then re-raised them. So, um, but if you do want to speak now, go for it, um, Lawrence. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good, thank you. The, this constant, unremitting countywide debate on rail versus trail, and by that I mean trail with expanded subsidized metro service, is like a person in love in this case, in love with trains and undoubtedly with the financial rewards that will flow to select developers. Are we going to turn our county into Disneyland when expanded equitable bus transportation for the whole length of the branch line is put on the back burner? And when a world-class trail is blocked for 5% of illusory net profits, is that what we're doing here? This rail obsession is all emotion, no logic, no financial sense, except for very few. And that is why we need the RTC to exercise sound, unbiased judgment. That took me one minute and three seconds. Thank you. Anne Kaplan and then Rebecca. Good morning. Um, I want, first of all, I want to thank the members of the RTC for your, your great effort and time in making clear-headed and careful evaluations of the various transit proposals. 
I know social, I believe social equity is a major focus in any kind of transit plan. And that is completely disregarded by the TIG M plan where no service is proposed to Watsonville. An enhanced Metro service could be realized without major infrastructure expenditure. And the statements that have been made in this uh, oral communication illustrates the need for an enhanced Metro service. Ride, riders complaining about lengthy, lengthy waits, lengthy rides, perhaps because there's not adequate service at this point in time. A true zero carbon footprint would be a pedestrian bike path, which could be used by all residents free of charge. A rail system is for the few who can afford fare. A ped bike path and trail is for everyone. Thank you for your time. Rebecca Downey. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Great, good morning. Um, I have a couple things to say. The first is I think all these comments about the TIG should wait until the agenda item uh, 19 because they're distracting from other comments people wanna make that are not related to that. Um, which is my comment, which I believe the RTC needs more attention focused on the maintenance of this corridor before adding any new type of transit, including the planned trails. I'm talking specifically about drainage, clearing of brush, removal of trees. I live on North Avenue and the neighbors here, we've been trying to get some uh, help along the rail line to clear the brush because it's been a fire hazard. I realize now it's rain, so maybe this is a good time to take care of that. Union Pacific used to clear the brush away and the last uh, contractor that you used did not. They just left it and they dumped some of it into the drainage that uh, is behind North Avenue. So I've already written to the RTC about this and I hope that you're all listening today and can maybe take a look at that. Um, the other thing is uh, regarding maintenance is also safety. Um, I believe that the current sections of the, tra of the trail that have a fence on both sides is too narrow for everybody. It looks kind of dangerous, especially if you have a cyclist going quickly in one direction and maybe some pedestrians with strollers and dogs on the other side. And also I'd just like to share that I've been on the west side quite a bit recently. And what I've noticed myself personally is at the crossing, I have witnessed both pedestrians and cyclists zooming across the street and refusing or not knowing to stop. So I think it's important that you look at that. Thank you. Commissioner Brown, I don't see any other hands. Uh, thank you, Yesenia. Uh, so thank you all for your for your comments during oral communications. I, I want to make a, a quick statement here um, because I recognize that the mentioning TIGAM and kind of conflating the Coast Futura demonstration because TIGAM was one of the co-sponsors and the um, provider of the, the vehicle um, that they're, it's, these are getting kind of inevitably conflated. So, um, and I recognize that that could be distracting with respect to the broader um, issues that people have been uh, raising before us today. So um, having said that, and I will remind folks when we get to item 19, um, please um, reserve your comments for the specifics of the TIGAM proposal. We've talked about the demonstration. People have been talking about their hopes and dreams for the rail, the right of way and what is to be done there. Um, and um, so I, I just want to make sure we stay focused and don't just use that as an opportunity to say the same thing in our um, upcoming uh, general business. So thank you for uh, uh, being here to make comments. And we are now going to move on to our consent. Actually, we have uh, additions or deletions to the agenda before we move on. And Greg, I Brown, I'm sorry, Commissioner Brown, it looks like Commissioner Caput has yeah. his hand up. Yeah, I, I see your hand up. Just checking on changes to the agenda. Um, Commissioner Caput, please uh, oh, go okay. ahead. Well, I, I thought uh, uh, this would be a good time, but uh, uh, you're waiting for uh, item number 19. But 
Uh, quickly, I'll just say uh, uh, I was at the uh, train uh, rail demonstration on a couple of weeks ago here in Watsonville, and it, went, it was a beautiful event. Uh, Lowell was there. I was there with my whole family. And uh, Commissioner Calvert. Yeah, Ma I'm sorry. No, no, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to let you know that you also have an opportunity when we um, when commissioners update the commission That's and true. the public. So you can talk about it then um, as well. Thanks. Okay, that's fine. And, and uh, well, anything, uh, I, I guess it's related to 19 also, but uh, if you look uh, in the dictionary for definitions, uh, equitable was brought up by people in the public there. Uh, three words basically would uh, define equitable. That would be rail, trail, at Watsonville, that's equitable. Uh, disadvantaged neighborhood, if you looked it up in the dictionary, you only need one word to define disadvantaged neighborhood, and that's Watsonville, California, Watsonville, one word. So that's, that's all I wanted to say, thank you. Uh, okay, so delish, additions or deletions to the agenda? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair Brown. There are no deletions, but there are two handouts for items 16 and 19, and they are both posted on our website. Thank you. Okay, we will now move on to our consent agenda. All items appearing on the consent agenda are considered to be uh, minor or non-controversial, will be acted upon in one motion if no member of the RTC or public wishes to pull any of those items for discussion, um, and in which case they would move to the regular agenda. Um, you Members of the commission can raise questions or ask for clarification, add direction to consent items without removing them. Um, and um, so I will ask commissioners, do you have, uh, are there items you'd like to remove from our consent agenda? This is items four through 14 on our agenda today. Um, would anyone like to remove an item and or ha does anyone have a question from the commission? Okay, uh, seeing none, um, I will then ask if members of the public have, um, oh, um, Commissioner Bertrand, did you wanna? Okay, um, sorry, quick hand up there. Okay, um, so uh, members of the public, any comments on items that are on our consent agenda? These are again, items four through 14. Okay. Move um, approval. Second. Okay, we have a motion uh, to approve the minute or the consent agenda. I, I'm, by... sorry, I'm sorry, Chair Brown. I did wanna go back and I'm slow on the, I'm slow on the mute button, I apologize. On item uh, 10, the full vax COVID-19 vaccination or a weekly negative test result. I just had a question as to why the taxpayer should have to pay someone to get a negative test result on the taxpayer's hour, rather than why the employee shouldn't be securing that test result on their own time as a condition for showing up for work. Madam Chair, if I may, that there, there's a state law requirement that if the agency is gonna require that there be uh, testing, for, for individuals who may not be vaccinated that the employer is actually required to pay for that. And so can I make an asterisk then if that's a significant number of people or time we arrange for at work uh, testing to be available? Um, Mr. So I could address that question if um, I might, Chair Brown. Um, Surveyed all of our employees, we have about 20 um, all of our employees are vaccinated. One employee declined to state, so there would only uh, be one employee where this would um, affect RTC. Thanks, Guy. Okay, um, so we now have a motion by Commissioner Rotkin, second by, I don't know quite who is about there first. Uh, Schifrin. Schifrin, thank you. Um, I heard a few voices. Okay, so we have a motion and a second, and we'll take a roll call vote uh, on approval of consent, the consent agenda. Commissioner Bertrand? I agree. Commissioner Brown? Aye. Commission Alternate uh, Schifrin? Aye. 
Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Montesino? Yes. Commissioner Caput? Aye. Commissioner Alternate Quinn? Approved. Commissioner Koenig? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Northcutt? Aye. Commissioner Rotkin? Commissioner Rotkin? He's on mute. <laughs> And before we move forward, Commissioner Brown, I just want to note that Commissioner Scott Eads is present and I didn't call his name during roll call. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Good to see you, Mr. Eads. Okay, uh, moving along uh, onto our regular agenda. Item 15 is uh, commissioner reports. These are oral reports from members of the commission on um, anything you'd like to update uh, your colleagues and the public uh, related to transportation in Santa Cruz County. Uh, Commissioner Peterson. Thank you. And I believe this would be the appropriate time for me to speak on this matter, but please feel free to, uh, to stop me if I'm incorrect uh, on that front. Um, I've been on this board for, for approximately, excuse me, this commission for approximately eight or nine, nine months now. And whenever I join a new body such as this, I typically take some time uh, to listen more than I speak because I learn more from listening than I do from speaking. And with this board, I've spent significantly longer period of time um, with very little comment due to the complexity of the issues um, and the sheer volume of historical documentation, historical knowledge, and actions that I needed to bring myself up to speed on. Um, I'm coming to the point now where I'm prepared to engage much more vocally than I have to date, uh, beginning with the comments that I'd like to share now and then later in the agenda on another item. Um, what I want to address today is that recently we received a number of emails, I believe in response uh, to a, a letter to the editor, suggesting that our colleague Commissioner Rod can be removed from the RTC Commission for his support of the recent rail demonstration. And while Mike and I have not always agreed on this particular issue as demonstrated by our voting history, I feel the need to address this disappointing recommendation that he be removed from our commission. As I mentioned, Mike and I have not always seen eye to eye on votes pertaining to this rail v, uh, v trail debate. However, I've walked sections of the track with Mike, I've chatted with him about these issues, uh, issues on several occasions, and I've always found him to be a thoughtful decision maker that casts his votes based on the facts laid before him, as I believe all on this board uh, work to do. I want to point out that Mike and I both sit on this board as representatives of Metro, and that it was Mike himself that recommended that I be appointed to the RTC. I wanna take this moment to thank Mike for his service, not only on this board, but the Metro board and throughout our community over the years. And I wanna encourage my fellow RTC commissioners to reach out to each other and find ways to communicate our support of issues where we can find common ground, especially as the dialogue uh, outside of this body from both sides grows continually more divisive. Um, so I just felt a, a need to share that with the emails that we received um, it, it really struck a chord with me and I felt the need to thank Mike for his service and encourage us all to find ways uh, that we can find common ground and work together as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you for that, Commissioner Peterson. Are there others who'd like to comment? Okay, so yeah, I-, I I'm sorry, Commissioner Rockin has his hand up. Commissioner Rockin, there you are. Um, <laughs> uh, probably in, in my briefest comment ever, I want to thank thank uh, Kristen for her comments. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Um, so um, yeah, I, I I too want to I'll, yeah, um, take a moment to say I, I want to thank uh, Commissioner Peterson for speaking up here. I agree. Uh, completely with the the comments, and you know, I just will use the opportunity to make a more general comment about uh, the you know what what I consider to be an increasingly personalized um, attacks going on within our debate. We are here to discuss 
policy and programming. Um, and as Commissioner Peterson said, weigh our decisions based upon the evidence before us. And, um, and so I, I hope that members of the public, um, you know, as commissioners, we've been uh, are, you know, making our best efforts to, to work together even when we disagree. And I hope we can continue to do that. And I would just ask members of the public to, to also think about that, the way that uh, your comments, um, you know, affect the, the, the folks who are on this body, uh, trying to represent the public in, you know, and work in the public interest. That is what we are all trying to do, although we may come to different conclusions. So um, thank you for opening up the space to, to talk about that. And we will now move on to um, our next item, which is our director's report. And Mr. Preston, that is you. Thank you, Chair Brown and commissioners. Um, first, I want to welcome Commissioner Alpa Northcutt. Uh, Commissioner Northcutt was recently, recently appointed to Santa Cruz Metro by the Watsonville City Council and then subsequently appointed to the RTC by Metro. Uh, this is Commissioner Northcutt's first RTC meeting, so welcome to Commissioner Northcutt. Um, I have a few announcements. Um, RTC has officially completed its move to the University Center building located at 1101 Pacific Avenue, Suite 250. We are still unpacking boxes and settling into our new home. We are working on adding technology to allow for hybrid committee meetings to be held in our new conference rooms. Staff will be transitioning from nearly full-time remote schedules to new hybrid schedules over the next two months. We have maintained normal productivity throughout the pandemic and are excited to be welcoming in the new normal as we move towards the beginning of the new year. Um, I'd like to um, uh, let you know that we're, we're sad to be losing a member of our staff. Uh, Fernanda Pini is moving on from the RTC. Uh, Fernanda originally was hired as an administrative assistant. Um, she was responsible for coordination of these RTC meetings and agenda packets for quite some time. Uh, she was interested in planning work and switched roles to become a planning technician. She was a big help to me in drafting the inaugural Measure D strategic implementation plan. Uh, she was actively assisting in the Scotts Creek Restoration Project, the reg Regional Conservation Investment Study, and providing contract management support to many of our project managers. Fernanda, um, she's very adaptable. Uh, she's got positive energy, and the quality of her work will be missed. Um, she um, moved here from Brazil as a young child and is going to be moving back for a period of time before eventually coming back to the United States. Um, I'd like to also announce that um, RTC just hired a new administrative assistant. Um, uh, Cindy Convisser joined RTC's administrative team on November 1st. Ms. Convisser has worked um, preparing technical documents, proposals, and contracts in the private sector for 14 years and has served as a volunteer for community organizations here in Santa Cruz. She received her AS in business and a certificate in accounting at Cabrillo College in 2006. So welcome Cindy to the RTC. Um, I would like to provide an update on one of our other programs, um, the Santa Cruz County, um, uh, Go Santa Cruz County program. Uh, since launching in October of 2019 with downtown Santa Cruz employees, more than 2,200 commuters have registered um, for Go Santa Cruz County. Participants have logged over 150,000 alternative commute miles, and by doing so, have reduced CO2 emissions by more than 50 tons. The Go Santa Cruz County program offers incentives to help employees throughout the county choose options other than driving alone to get to work. These include gift cards, rewards for logging smart commute trips, active transportation and bike safety training, carpool and vanpool, ride matching, and emergency ride home reimbursement. Downtown Santa Cruz employees are also eligible for additional benefits, including free bus passes, bike locker cards, and downtown dollars that have access to a number of ecology action benefits, including zero interest bus loans up to $1,500 free one-to-one -one bike commute con consultations and free two-week long bike e-bike test rides for a limited time. Downtown employees enrolled in the Go Santa Cruz 
uh, County platform can apply for a $200 e-bike rebate or $400 rebate for low-income individuals. Go Santa Cruz County, uh, Go Santa Cruz expanded countywide to become Go Santa Cruz County in mid-2021, and anyone who lives or works in Santa Cruz County is now eligible to participate in the program. Employers can also use the Go Santa Cruz County platform for their own commute programs. Interested employers can reach out to staff for more information by emailing info at cruise511.org. Staff are currently exploring opportunities to offer more robust incentives and commute challenges for participants working outside of downtown Santa Cruz. Visit gosantacruzcounty.org to sign up and start earning rewards for choosing a sustainable commute. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Director Preston. Uh, are there questions for Mr. Preston? Uh, Commissioner Bertrand. Well, thank you, Chair. Um, I was wondering, Guy, is there a chance for a, uh, I guess, an introduction to the new quarters? Or is there going to be like an opening party or some other way for us to get acquainted with the new digs? Thank you. Right now, we don't have anything like that scheduled. We're transitioning back to the office. Um, when we think it's appropriate to do so, I'll make such an announcement, but I think that would be a good idea. Okay, we'll take it out to the public for any questions or comments on the director's report. And... Seeing none, we'll move on to um, item 17, the Caltrans report. Uh, Mr. Eads, you're up. All right. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair and members of the commission. Again, Scott Eads here for Caltrans. I have a few project updates and then one, uh, one thing to share about a grant application or grant um, opportunity. So first, uh, we have talked about the Santa Cruz 17 wildlife crossing project. I uh, just wanted to provide a super quick update that the, the start of that project in terms of construction has been delayed until February uh, 1st, 2022. So um, we will be beginning construction and coordinating with um, others on a uh, groundbreaking ceremony on that as well and some other announcements. Second thing I wanted to update on is the California Transportation Commission recently allocated $960 million at um, its recent meeting. Um, that included one sh uh, shop funded project, which is um, managed through Caltrans. The project is on Route 1, and it will replace and upgrade existing corrugated metal pipe culverts with reinforced concrete uh, pipe culverts. Project is located near Davenport from north of Swanson Road to south of Waddle Creek. It's about $9 million um, in, in, current, in total cost. And we expect um, construction will also begin in February for that project. And I will, um, we also that anticipate that there will be some one-way traffic and fault and control involved with flaggers. Um, so more information to come on that as construction gets closer. And then just as a reminder, there's um, lots of other information about other projects in the state highway system in your packet that we include in every meeting. And then finally, just wanted to conclude with uh, Clean California. We've talked about this in the past as well. Um, there has been a new application workshop um, added for Thursday, November 18th from 10 a.m. to noon. And this is specific to the local grant program. As a reminder, there's nearly $300 million available statewide um, this is from the general fund. It's not from transportation dollars, so it's not diminishing other funding sources. And um, the local grant program is specifically focused to local jurisdictions um, to be able to apply for those funds. So I'll post a link in the chat if that works on that um, grant program for more information. That concludes my report. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair? Yes. Um, yeah, I, this is uh, Commissioner McPherson, not Guy Preston. I think you know. But uh, anyway, um, it, have we made any application on the Clean California, or what is our uh, idea? If it's going to be, what, November 18th, it's going to be discussed. Could you clarify if, if we have done anything or if we're going to do anything on that? So 
I think that's it's a question, question to me. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. You, the, the other yeah. Mr. Preston, yes. We are looking into it um, specifically for the rail corridor, which is the only property that RTC owns. Um, I don't know if the county or cities are, are planning to apply separately, but we're having a hard time um, really feeling, figuring out whether or not um, an application will, will qualify under the guidelines. Um, so we, we haven't completely ruled it out, but um, um, you have to really look at the details to kind of realize whether or not it, it's going to work and, and there's a high chance probability that we'll actually be able to receive grant funds. And if I may, through the chair, clarify that the applications, uh, the call for projects will begin in December and uh, the applications were, I think, are due in late January or early February. So there is some time still, um, but yeah, definitely pay attention to the application um, criteria. May, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other questions from commissioners? All right, we'll take it out to the public uh, for any comments or questions from meeting attendees about the Caltrans report. And seeing none, uh, we will move on to our next item, which is uh, item 18. This is a report on Assembly Bill 361, uh, making findings for virtual and hybrid meetings um, and the format of our meetings moving forward. And that will be uh, Mr. Mendez, our Deputy Director, I believe. Hello, Mr. Mendez, you're on. Good morning, Madam Chair, and good morning, uh, Commissioners. Uh, as, as you know, uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, our, our governor, issued a state of emergency in March of 2020, and uh, also issued a number of executive orders suspending some of the Brown Act requirements for public agency meetings to allow public agencies to hold uh, meetings uh, virtually and ensure that the business of government would continue uh, through the pandemic. And uh, uh, those executive orders expired in September 30th of 2021. Uh, however, the legislature did approve uh, Assembly Bill 361 and the governor signed it into law, which allows the possibility to continue meetings um, in a virtual format or a hybrid format, uh, if that's desired, um, by public agencies. Uh, and in order to be, and the first meetings, the first meeting that uh, the RTC held under AB 361 was uh, your meeting at the la uh, last month. Uh, and in order to continue, um, meetings that are either virtual meetings or hybrid meetings, uh, the RTC must make certain findings as required by AB 361. And those findings are that the RTC has uh, reconsidered the circumstances of the uh, COVID-19 state of emergency, which is still in place, and also that the uh, state of emergency continues to directly impact the ability of the members of the RTC's committees and staff uh, and the public to participate in person safely and also the state or local officials continue to impose um, or, or recommend measures to promote uh, social distancing. Um, so that's what this, so this item is before you so that you can make uh, such findings uh, and so you can continue to hold meetings virtually if you desire or can all, the meetings can also be uh, hybrid meetings which uh, would include some components of, of virtual meetings. It is possible to hold uh, hybrid meetings at the County Board of Supervisors Chambers. Uh, the County Board of Supervisors has been holding heavy meetings for, for some time now. Um, however, the County Board of Supervisors is set up for, all, for only up to four, uh, I mean, up to five board members. Uh, and, is, and this commission has 12 uh, board members. And with uh, uh, Mr. Eads of, of Caltrans, uh, that makes it 13 uh, board members. So, so we couldn't accommodate all of all the commissioners in person at the County Board of Supervisors Chambers. Now, the maximum we could accommodate for a hybrid meeting is, is, is five um, board members. Uh, at this point, we're not aware that any of the city council chambers are available for hybrid meetings, but that may that may come uh, uh, eventually. Uh, uh, also, any anyone participating in person at those uh, hybrid meetings 
would be required to wear masks. Uh, so that would be you know, members of the, uh, of the commission and staff, as well as members of the public who might, who might attend uh, in person. Uh, it is expected that the commission does do uh, hybrid meetings. Most uh, individuals will continue to participate uh, virtually and uh, staff would have to uh, find out from commissioners, you know, well, well, who are interested in participating in person to ensure that uh, no more than five commissioners would be at a, uh, at a meeting uh, in person. So, um, and also, even though there are a, you know, a suspension of some of the uh, uh, Brown Act requirements so that uh, either hybrid or virtual meetings can be held, uh, there are still requirements in place to ensure that you know, the public can, uh, that they can be open meetings and the public can participate and so on, et cetera. So the, the commission will still continue to do advance uh, notification and posting of, of agendas to be sent to us in advance. Accommodations need to be made for the public to be able to access and participate the meetings and accommodations need to be made to make sure that the public can address um, uh, the meeting uh, members of the commission uh, directly on any, any matters that are under the purview of the of the RTC, and uh, also um, um, if for some reason uh, there is a um, uh, an interruption in the uh, uh, in the service, you know, the internet service, or something that that allows it that makes it uh, uh, impossible for uh, the meeting to continue to be broadcast for members of the public to be able to participate in the meeting, then meetings must be put on hold until such issues are resolved you know, to make sure that the, the, the meeting can continue uh, completely open and that the public can participate accordingly. So with that, uh, staff does recommend that the RTC find that the RTC has reconsidered the circumstances of the current COVID-19 state of emergency. Uh, the state of emergency continues to directly impact the ability of the members of the RTC, its committees, its staff, and the public to meet safely in person and state and local officials continue to impose and recommend measures to promote social distancing. And it also, it, it is the intent that for committee meetings, those will continue to be held uh, virtually because those are held in conference rooms which are not equipped to allow for, for hybrid meetings. And also members of committees have expressed uh, uh, concern regarding uh, safety uh, in, with meetings that um, might include some people in person and, and would prefer to continue to meet uh, virtually. That concludes my staff report. Thank you, Mr. Mendez. So um, we have received the report. Are there questions from commissioners um, about how we will be proceeding? Uh, well, I wanna leave an opportunity for questions right now and then uh, ask your public input and then bring it back if, if folks wanna talk about how you'd like to proceed. Um, after that. So questions. Yeah, Madam Chair, again, um, I, uh, I appreciate uh, that. And I, I think that uh, this is the way we should proceed. Um, I want to let uh, folks know that the County uh, Board of Supervisors wrote a letter to the CPUC saying that uh, this uh, system, if you will, uh, call it that, of uh, power shutoffs that have occurred uh, continuously is just not acceptable for safety and other reasons. Uh, the, we got a very pointed and uh, very strong uh, response letter from the chair of the uh, California Public Utilities Commission saying uh, she and the commission is very concerned about it and they are going to have monthly reports from pg and &E about that whole system. Uh, so uh, it wasn't lighthearted by any means, her response, and I was very appreciative that of her immediate response. and. Uh, really the uh, seriousness that they, uh, the PUC is taking this situation that we've ex experienced, uh, particularly up in the San Lorenzo Valley and the more mountainous areas. But uh, uh, PUC is very much engaged in uh, seeing this corrected or having a, uh, a better system of response be uh, put in place by PG&E. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. Um, okay, uh, Commissioner Hernandez. And then Commissioner Rock, and I got you next. You know, I was going to ask uh, folks that are um, on the super uh, supervisors about the advantages of uh, hybrid and, and uh, virtual. 
I, I guess I just kind of heard right now some of the comments. Uh, I was thinking about, you know, internet connectivity for some of the people that live uh, either in places that don't have uh, good connections. But the also the, what was just brought up about uh, power shut power shutoffs and uh, you know the uh, PG and E uh, issues is uh, another concern. So I, you know I'm leaning towards the hybrid. Uh, I guess is a, might be might be the better option over just the the hundred uh, percent virtual uh, for folks that actually need to come come in and have both better internet access and have power too when they have uh, power shutoffs. So just my comment, but I had a question, but I, I was just answered by some of the comments right now. But if anybody else has comments to it about the advantages and disadvantages. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Hernandez. Um, Commissioner Rockin, did you have your hand up? Okay, I thought I saw it. Okay, um, I think that's the sunshine. It looks like a hand from <laughs> over here. Um, Commissioner Bertrand, you're up. And you were on mute, sorry. Yeah, gotta get used to it. Uh, power outage around the uh, county is very concerning to me. And so some people might be able to get uh, reception because their computers are working and others may not. So um, the prior comment may make some sense. Um, my question to staff is, do we have backup power in case there's a shutoff of power? If we were able to broadcast when that was the situation, maybe that might be acceptable. Just a question for a guy. I can, I can uh, go ahead and try to re respond if that's okay. Um, we, we do have uh, backup power for the computers that we have in, in, in our in our office, uh, but that 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 only allows uh, power for a short period of time. However, you know when when we, these meetings are being broadcast, it's not just the equipment uh, in our office because we're using community TV for the service. So it's also you know the, so they're using their their uh, their equipment uh, and 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 systems. Um, so I expect they do have. Uh, backup uh, power uh, as well to make sure that their systems can continue to be in place for a period of time. But you know, depending on on how much power might have, my uh, power might be out, I, I don't know how long they could continue uh, to uh, have a meeting. So, in reference to your answer, um, that's a good point. So, the meeting is dispersed everywhere. Um, PG&E often gives us a notice that there might be a shutdown. Is there a possibility that we could send out a notice to the public ahead of time that the RTC meeting may be suspended and set a further date in the future? I, I suppose one possibility um, is that if we are aware that there could be a, uh, a power shutdown during a commission meeting, I mean, it's something that could be communicated when the meeting begins potentially so people know um i don't know if we would know with sufficient time in advance to put something on our agenda potentially uh so just maybe it might, it might depend on when we're aware what the commission could potentially do to notify members of the public yeah I, 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 oh excuse me um yeah i realize there's a lot of uncertainty but at least have some sort of procedure so that the public interests can be accommodated uh, Commissioner Brown, may I uh, add something to Luisa's answer? Uh, so we would receive a notice for the RTC office, but we're not receiving notices for the county office, which is where we would be holding our commission meeting. So we would need to coordinate with the county if they receive uh, notices. Commissioner Rotkin, go for it. Yeah, so um, I, I think the issue here is that um, whether or not we're going to have power outages, it, it's number one, unlikely as the rainy season moves in. So we have some time to try and think about this in terms of that particular issue. I also think instead of just, you know, figuring out how can we let people know when we've been shut down, we should be more proactive and send a formal letter to PG&E. The, the city of Santa Cruz doesn't get shut off very often. Uh, we don't have the, the same kind of fire risk that they have up in the uh, San Lorenzo Valley and other places. 
So I, I think we can be reasonably secure. You know, if we tell PG&E, you know, when, when you make these, these uh, shutoffs are selective, they pick areas and stuff and they can decide which areas they're gonna shut down. It's not perfectly tailored to like decide, you know, where the line's gonna be drawn or something. But I think we should have a formal request from our, I don't think it takes a vote to do it, but our staff should formally let um, PG&E know when our meetings are and that we'd like to make sure that they make a special effort not to shut the power off to the, uh, not just to us, but to the community television site or all the other places in the urban area here where, um, and I think that's probably more useful in some way than sort of after the fact, trying to figure out how we can scramble around to let people know that we've lost the power. And I, I don't think it's gonna be a certain, frankly, I don't see the power getting shut off here a lot in the winter time. Um, it, it'd be more likely shut off because the telephone pole falls down or something, because you know, the power line falls down than, uh, than because there's, you know, worried about fire risk and that, that whole uh, problem that we're confronting. My view is that, for now, it, uh, the hybrid met, uh, meeting is just as problematic as having the meetings totally virtually. And some of our customers may not be able to get to us. That's an issue when people in the San Lorenzo Valley, as Bruce pointed out, um, you know, may not be able to access the meeting. But I don't know that there's anything better than a virtual meeting where we do our best to make sure that at least the projection power, the, our ability to broadcast what we're doing or narrow cast what we're doing, um, is really what we need to keep secure on some level. And it, uh, this was supposed to be just questions, but I mean, my general sense is that at this point, we should direct staff to look for the opportunities for transition towards virtual or eventually open meetings, uh, uh, in-person meetings. But for the time being, that the virtual meetings are about as effective as we can be, given the concerns people have about safety and all the other issues and the inadequacy of any of the rooms that might be available to us. Those are my views. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rodkin. Um, I see Commissioner Schifrin and then Commissioner Randy Johnson. I just wanted to very quickly, if we're moving into the comment portion, um, before, if this is not questions, I'd like to just ask uh, if there are members of the public who want to speak, and then we can come back and deliberate and kind of decide if, if anybody wants to make a motion that um, reflects additional uh, additional uh, or different recommendations from that in the staff report. So, um, is that okay? I can move it. If yeah, if it's if we're quest if, yeah, if it's a comment, I just like to wait for one moment and just make sure. Um, anybody uh, are there members of the public who would like to comment on uh, this item before the commission takes action? I see one hand up that is equity and environment. I believe uh, that is Ms. Faulkner. Yes. I, I just want to clarify, because I've been in and out that this is some um, voting for or speaking about um, remote and in-person meetings. Is that correct? Correct. Awesome. So yes, I am absolutely in favor of at least remote, if not both, for so many of us in the community, it's an equity issue. It's already hard enough to make it to the meetings for those of us who work or have various other obligations as well. And so um, I am definitely for many reasons, especially around the equity piece in favor of at least having a hybrid. The hybrid of course is nice because it offers that in-person touch when you get a chance to meet people but then having the um, Zoom capabilities allows the public to actually participate in the public process. And I, I feel very strongly that remote should actually be um, a format required in all uh, meetings that involve the public. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, uh, Gina Cole, you're up next. Good morning. Um, I too would uh, like to reiterate uh, Ms. Faulkner's comments. Um, as a member of the Watsonville, um, City of Watsonville Planning Commission, I made that request at our meeting this week um, because I feel like we were losing people that we had gained by having remote meetings. Um, I believe that hybrid is definitely the way to go and that, you know, post pandemic things change and it doesn't have to go back to exactly the way that it was. So if if public meetings have at all have the capacity and the capability for um, sharing to a broader community, I, I would encourage you to continue doing what you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Okay, I see more hands going up. Um, uh, so we'll I'll call on Kyle Kelly next. Hey, thank you. Uh, so I just want to say, as a parent of three kids, it's been really useful to be able to come to virtual meetings because um, I can easily put things in between while I'm working with my toddler or going to work myself. Um, and I think, it, it, you know, especially for the Transportation Commission, which stretches the county, um, it, it leads to having more, if, if it's only in person, it leads to people that already live close to Santa Cruz, like where I do, to be able to just go um, directly to where the meetings are held. Uh, whereas if anybody is, you know, further out in the county, um, they have much less easy access to be able to, to comment on items for the public. So um, big support for making sure that we do at least hybrid meetings uh, and virtual meetings have been great. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, Jack Brown, you next. Hi, um, just wanted to say how wonderful it is that uh, I am in complete agreement with uh, Lonnie Faulkner and Kyle. Usually we're on opposite ends of the spectrum, but uh, um, the only way I've really been able to get involved with the RTC meetings live is because of the virtual aspect of it as I'm a, a, a working adult and uh, a commute. And it was very challenging to have to take a day off or otherwise if, if I really wanted to be involved. This makes it you know, much easier and, and also shows a way that we can sort of beat the commute mentality of uh, you know not necessarily having to be in a place uh, uh, where you know we can we can relieve traffic by using technology in one sense. So um, really glad that uh, it's being considered as a hybrid or, or keeping virtual. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, through time we can find more common points on both sides. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Jessica Evans. You're up. Thank you, commissioners. Um, thank you for um, considering the option of going to um, hybrid meetings instead of going back to in-person. Um, I will say that, you know, um, it's an incredible privilege to be, uh, you know, a person who doesn't have to work in Santa Cruz. And um, I, you know, I just have had many, many long tracks to, to these meetings. And, um, and not everyone has the capacity to do that. Most people, the great majority of people uh, who would like to participate don't have the capacity to take the like half a day and that you know you all know it requires to attend a, one of these meetings in person. So please um, do continue to you know to have the, a hybrid. Um, and you know, and some people can't deal with the technology. So you know, hybrid you know is really important because it's the most accessible and the most equitable for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any more hands up from the public, so I'll bring it back. Uh, Commissioner Schifrin, you're next. Yes, thank you. Um, I think it's important to have hybrid meetings. Um, the concern about uh, PG&E and uh, internet access isn't so much from my perspective a concern about whether we'll be able to broadcast, but whether people in rural areas will be able to receive those broadcasts. And I think um, we've had a good deal of experience uh, with poor internet service in a number of the rural areas. I know certainly in the third district, uh, this has been a problem. And what that means is that uh, residents of those areas are really unable to participate. And I think, you know, I, I think there, it might be a little bit cumbersome to have hybrid meetings where we can only have four uh, members at the board meeting, but there should be a process of signing up in advance. Um, I know I would prefer uh, coming in person and seeing people who are telling me what they think I should do. Um, and so um, I'm, I, I would, re I think it's really important to have hybrid meetings. Uh, so that there are um, members of our community who, for reasons outside of their control, uh, can participate in our meetings while uh, allowing for people who, for, for a whole variety of reasons, uh, can't or don't want to or are unable to come to a, uh, a board meeting to be still be able to participate virtually. 
Thank you. Okay. If it's uh, appropriate, I would make a motion to move forward, direct staff to move forward with setting up hybrid meetings. I'll second it. Okay. So we have a motion on the floor to. Um, I assume the motion includes the findings necessary to be able to carry this out that Luis told us about. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, motion and a second on the floor to um, recommend the the staff the recommendations in the staff report and to move towards hybrid meetings. Um, now, I just want to make sure I'm tracking. Commissioner Johnson, you had a comment. Uh, did you want to make that now? Yeah, just just quick. I completely agree with Mike Rotkin in terms of the facility of uh, hybrid meetings. Um, you know, we've had we've had what twenty. Uh, 18 months of the, these types of meetings with no real interruptions. So I'm, I, I don't really want to borrow trouble that all of a sudden we're going to have interruptions for no apparent reason. Sure, fire, storms, those are all possible. Um, and with respect to hybrid in person, uh, sure, if it works out for the commission um, and for our staff, uh, having just four people. Um, and also, we kind of uh, address this, I think, with our city council. Uh, informally, uh, we are coming into the flu season, you know, so in-person stuff, um, maybe wait till spring to kind of just really, really pursue that. Uh, but it sounds like um, we're moving in the right direction. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Um, okay. Um, uh, let Chair me clarify, if I could, that my motion was uh, to move towards hybrid meetings as soon as possible. Thank you. Um, so, Mike, I got you just one sec. Commissioner Hurst, um, or uh, I don't know, are you commissioner alternate right now or, or uh, yes. council member Hurst? <laughs> okay, so um, um, Mr. Hurst, Commissioner Hurst, uh, you're up. Well, yes, thank you very much. Uh, I too uh, support the, uh, the good efforts to uh, promote the remote uh, access. You know, in the often uh, forgotten parts of uh, Watsonville, it's uh, it's a real struggle to be able to make uh, some of these in-person meetings, although I prefer the in-person meetings. This does give more equity and access, and uh, that's what we're looking for in Watsonville is equity and access. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Rotkin. You know, the problem we're trying to solve, I think mainly is not whether we can meet as a commission dependent upon the things, but whether people can attend our meetings and participate, members of the public. And so what we really need is not, a, I mean, it's fine to have five members rotate as Andy suggests through the, uh, through the meeting, but the real thing, what we need is a room somewhere with a microphone and a camera um, that, or a computer with a, you know, attached to a camera that allow members of the public who are probably faced often with this, both, uh, both problems, they have bad internet connections to where they are generally. Power outages are more likely to occur there, um, and so as long as the as long as the, the uh, uh, hybrid model really is a question of having an audience space where people can come who think that their power is likely to go out or they've been warned that it's going to go out, and so they can participate by coming with enough uh, social distancing between them with a large enough room. It's not it's not the dais that's important for us. It's more important that there be a place where you know 30 people or 40 people from the public who don't want to or cannot attend remotely are able to come in person and still you know intermix as you call on people from the public by being in a public room somewhere. So that, I think we should consider that when we're looking at how we might develop a hybrid model. And as I understand the motion, it's not that it happened next tomorrow, but that the staff begin thinking about how we would develop a hybrid model. And I hope they'll take my comments into account when they do that. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Schifrin. Yeah, I just, uh, I agree with uh, Mike that there needs to be a room, but the Board of Supervisors has been ha holding hybrid meetings for months. Uh, the Board of Supervisors chambers uh, have uh, successfully been set up to have hybrid meetings. And I think as the staff report said, um, somehow only four, um, four members of a, the body can be there. But there may be five. I see you're saying his hand says five. five. So, um, you know, there could be five commissioners who attended. And there, there are protocols that the county uses, which I think the commission could use as well. And as far as I know, the hybrid meetings have been working. 
um, in that the, you know, there are members of the public who really want to be able to look at a commissioner in the eye, as well as members of the uh, public who, you know, really have problems with their internet access. And we have had technical problems where people haven't been able to get on for one reason or another. It's taken forever. We go back and forth. And so it's not like the virtual meetings are uh, universally applauded. Uh, I think that option has to be there. It's critical. It's critical now, and it may be critical into the uh, even beyond the pandemic, given the nature of our county. But I think uh, hybrid meetings have real benefits, uh, both for constituents uh, and I think for commissioners as well, to really be able to see some of the people who are uh, who are concerned about what we're doing. And so, you know, I uh, I I don't think it should be difficult. Um, to have community TV, I think, is set up at the county to be able to televise board meetings. And I, I just think that the difference will be only five of us can be there at any one meeting, but that's no different from where two or three board members uh, go to a board meeting and some people come in person and some people uh, phone in. I don't know if Commission, uh, Commissioner McPherson um, would like to comment on the board's uh, hybrid approach or not, but he certainly has lived with it. Uh, just briefly, it's worked very well. People who want to come can do so. They're required, there's some protocols, required masks and so forth. It's worked very well. And I think Supervisor Koenig would agree. It's, uh, it's a great option um, available to the general public. So I think it, it meets both um, the needs. Uh, people want to stay home and view it. Uh, that's fine. If they want to come to the board chamber, that's fine too. Uh, we do not usually have more than maybe a half a dozen at the most, probably, but uh, uh, it's worked well, I believe. And I, uh, Supervisor Koenig. And how auspicious. Uh, Commissioner Koenig, you are up next. <laughs> So you can weigh in on Thank that you, or yes. other I, matters. Definitely. I just wanted to echo that and um, also share my support for hybrid meetings. I think it's ultimately where we need to be as a commission, uh, really for all public meetings. And, uh, you know, I can confidently say that we've seen the maximum amount of participation through the hybrid format um, with both a number of in-person comments uh, at board supervisors meetings, as well as uh, quite a few online as well. I mean, I'd also comment that I don't think that there's, um, you, you, you know, there's no advantage to being in the in the chambers versus uh, virtual for even for board members or in this case commission members themselves. Uh, really, both uh, can participate equally. So it's where we need to be. Um, you know, as as uh, Commissioner Schifrin mentioned, community television has been a fantastic partner in making the technology side of things work. Um, you know, for now we'll be limited to five members, five commissioners uh, in the chambers, and that's mostly just because of the partitions on the dais uh, that were installed for safety. Um, but, you know, hopefully as those, as, as we move to less restrictions, as we get the pandemic greater under control and, and those partitions come down, uh, ultimately be able to accommodate as many people as want to be in the board chamber. So I'm definitely supportive of having hybrid meetings as soon as possible. Thank you, Commissioner Koenig. Okay, um, I don't see any more hands up. So um, I will just really quickly make a comment and then I think we have a uh, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Um, yeah, I'll just say you know I think that um, you know I concur with what's been expressed here by my colleagues about um, really having an interest in maximum accessibility for the public, and um, that you know we can we are finding ways to do that, and that a hybrid model uh, is most likely to achieve that that goal. Uh, of um, making the, the the commission and our deliberations accessible to people remotely, people who want to come into the um, meeting room. And um, I also want to recognize that this does present, um, you know, a higher level of coordination and logistics uh, for our staff. And, um, and I know that um, having, having heard from the, the staff at the city as we're moving through this as well at the city of Santa Cruz, um, you know, th those are, that's important to, to recognize. And um, so I'm fully in support of moving in this direction and also want to make sure that as soon as possible, um, 
you know, is is expressed fully uh, to the staff and that you you um, you know work in this direction. And I know you you already are. And um, and when when folks are ready, when you're ready, that um, you have commissioners who are ready to get back in the chambers. And um, uh, so I'll uh, with that um, call for a a vote. Uh, so before I start, um, Commissioner Hurst did step in for Commissioner Montesino. Thank, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Bertrand? I agree. Commissioner Brown? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Alternate Hurst? Aye. Commission Alternate Hernandez? Yes. Commission Alternate Schifrin? Aye. Commission Alternate Quinn? Yes. Commissioner Koenig? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Northcutt? Aye. Commissioner Rotkin? Aye. And that's unanimous. Okay, uh, Mr. Mendez. Uh, yes, uh, 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 Madam Chair. Just want to add that um, uh, it is the, the, the intent of staff to have an item like this for you at every meeting because it is a requirement of every 361 that you make these findings. Um, it, it, this, the law says uh, every 30 days or meetings sometimes are actually outside of the 30 day uh, time frame, but at every meeting, it's the, an item for these findings will be before you as long as it is, you know, the, the intent and desire of the commission to continue with uh, hybrid meetings, uh, that's, which is what you, what you would like. Um, and um, um, and it'll the item will be on the on your consent agenda uh, going forward. We don't anticipate that it'll need to be on the regular agenda. And also, I just want to add that uh, in addition to all the other amazing work that uh, Yesenia Parra and her and her staff have been doing to make sure that we move to a new office uh, and everything goes as well as possible and have our computer systems in place to work accordingly and everything. She's also been doing a, an amazing job of coming up to speed on how to make sure that we can do hybrid meetings and you know and learning from the county. Um, on how they they uh, conduct their meetings and so on, so that we can do that as successfully as possible for the commission. Uh, so it is the intent of staff uh, to um, have uh, you know, hybrid meetings uh, going forward. And and a huge huge thank you for that, uh, Commissioner Schifrin. Yes, I want to ask our attorney a question. Uh, I was under the impression that it would be possible for the commission to designate. The executive director to make that 30 day uh, designation, uh, particularly since the commission doesn't meet every 30 days, it meets once a month. And so there'll be times when we're not able to do it within that time period. Uh, my understanding is that by a vote of the commission, it is possible to designate uh, a commissioner, uh, uh, a staff member to file that, you know, make that whatever needs to be done on a, on a, 30, within every 30 days. Is that correct? So uh, I'll report back to the commission on that. That's, that is uh, that is not consistent with how I've seen other agencies do it. And it, and I believe the statute does talk about the, bo the legislative body making the findings. And, but it is, it is a, uh, the, the point Luis raises and that you raised commissioner is significant because there are a number of commissions that don't actually meet every 30 days. Some meet once a month, which creates a greater than 30 day differential, and some meet less frequently than that. And so I, I do anticipate that there will be um, some further direction from the state to address that issue because it's, it's at the moment creating uh, a need for a number of special meetings with agencies, and that is, uh, you know, it's problematic and not not very efficient. But I will look into that issue. I just not have have not experienced that with other agencies to date. I'm aware of one, and uh, I would ask that you maybe we get a report at our next meeting on that. Uh, absolutely, I'll, I'll advise the commission before then. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Just waiting to see if anybody else is going to chime in. Um, okay, I think we're moving on now to item 19. <laughs> and um, that is a um, report on uh, 
this this the item is titled uh, "Report on the Unsolicited Rail Proposal from Tig M and Roaring Camp." Uh, we have uh, materials in our packet related to this item, and um, our director, our executive director, Mr. Preston, will give us an oral report. Thank you, Chair Brown, Commissioners, and member of, of the public. Um, as Commissioner, as Chair Brown mentioned, this report is regarding the consideration of an unsolicited recreational passenger and freight route proposal by Tig M and Roaring Camp, with a staff recommendation not to pursue this unsolicited public-private partnership proposal or any other potential P3 proposal for passenger rail service at this time. Around the commencement of our Transit Corridor Alternatives Analysis, or TCAA, which was a study to determine the best potential transit option for the branch line, an innovative rolling stock manufacturer called TIGM gave a presentation on their right lightweight trolley and its hydrogen fuel cell technology at an RTC meeting. In December 2019, the commission authorized a temporary license for a demonstration contingent upon the inclusion of a demonstration in Watsonville. It was understood that the demonstration would be to provide an opportunity for the community to see the advancements of a new rail technology being studied in the TCAA and not an endorsement to enter into an operational agreement. The demonstration took place last month. I personally had the opportunity to ride in Watsonville. Big M makes a very nice product, which certainly demonstrates the advancement in clean energy technology and its applicability to the transportation sector. But that is really not the issue here today. I am glad that the community got the opportunity to see this technology and how it may be applicable to future decisions on the rail line. On September 1st of this year, TIG M and Roaring Camp submitted an unsolicited proposal focused on using TIG M cars for recreational rail service between Capitola and Davenport, with Roaring Camp providing freight rail service. The TIG M Roaring Camp concept proposal was an offer to design, build, partially finance, and deliver recreational rail service from Capitola to Davenport while maintaining freight service on the line. RTC's recently completed TCAA report selected battery-operated electric passenger rail as the locally preferred alternative for potential transit on the branch line for service between Pajaro Junction and Santa Cruz. The TCAA analyzed the performance and appropriateness of different classifications of electric rail vehicles, including heavier all-electric FRA compliant commuter trains and all-electric light rail trains. The report deferred making any decision on a rail vehicle classification, light commuter trolley, due to the rapid pace of technological advancements in the electric rail industry. The vision, however, was clear, a modern and reliable all-electric commuter service between Pajaro and Santa Cruz without the use of overhead electric lines. The TCAA considered all-electric trolleys, including the TIGM trolley, but trolleys are generally slower vehicles and are not suited for longer commutes. Nonetheless, RTC did not want to exclude any potential electric rolling stock and deferred any decision on rolling stock to a more appropriate time. Building and operating a new passenger rail system is not a money-making proposition. We're talking about public transportation, which is a highly subsidized venture. The TCAA and Associated Draft Business Plan estimated the capital costs for the locally preferred alternative be about $470 million for the initial build. Once constructed, the draft business plan estimated $25 million per year would be needed for operations and maintenance, or o &M. In addition to public subsidization of the initial build, the TCAA's draft business plan concluded that ticket prices would also need to be subsidized to make them affordable to the people that we are here to serve. The TCAA draft business plan estimated that it would take approximately 14 years to implement commuter rail for the full line. 
This is the time estimated to be needed to secure funding, complete an environmental document, acquire any needed right away, design and build the system, complete testing and commissioning, and starting the actual operations of a new commuter passenger rail service. Based on that schedule and assumptions, ST RTC estimates service could begin in about 2035, but that would be dependent upon funding. Okay, let's talk a little bit about P3s or public-private partnerships. P3s are long-term contractual agreements formed between a public agency and a private entity that allows for greater private sector participation in the delivery and financing of transportation projects. With P3s, the private sector may take on the risks and rewards of financing, constructing, operating, and or maintaining a transportation facility in exchange for the right to future revenues or payments for a specified period. P3s may expand the capacity of a government to finance infrastructure projects, potentially reducing project costs transferring project risks, and improving the cost effectiveness of long-term maintenance. However, P3s are complex transactions with notable trade-offs that require substantial review, due diligence, and technical expertise to manage effectively. Staff is not proposing a complete rejection of the P3 concept. In fact, it, is, it had discussed P3s in the draft TCA business plan. Staff is not recommending the negotiation of a P3 passenger rail project, whether it be commuter or recreational at this time. Let's talk a little bit about the actual unsolicited proposal we received. There were two components. The unsolicited rail proposal includes freight service by Roaring Camp. Roaring Camp would initially serve existing customers in Watsonville, which they are currently doing under a separate agreement with St. Paul. Pacific, who is our freight operator at the time, right now. The proposal includes a plan to maintain the track to class one standards that would allow 15 miles per hour for passengers and 10 miles per hour for freight rail. However, the proposal states that structural damage that is not normal wear and tear, such as acts of gods or pre-existing conditions shall be funded by the RTC. RTC estimates that the cost to RTC for those initial repairs would be about 50 to $65 million. The estimate is mainly due to bridge repairs, but also includes coastal erosion, drainage repairs, signal repairs, and track, pie, and ballast work that have been identified over the past several years due to our inspections. Also, due to the age and condition of major assets on the line, as well as the unknowns associated with the proposal's exclusions, such as natural disasters, acts of God, the additional annual maintenance and rehabilitation costs could also be substantial. Now let's talk about the TIGAM component. TIGAM proposes to use its heritage style trolleys for recreational rail service between just Capitola and Davenport. It did not include any passenger service for Watsonville. As mentioned in the previous section of this report, the proposal assumes RTC will pay for and complete initial repairs and upgrades to the track. TIGAM proposes investing $26 million for additional track remediation on approximately 17.5 miles between Capitol and Davenport, including installing at least one passing siding eight passenger stations in an operation and maintenance facility at unspecified locations. TIGAM assumed 50 minute headways, that's the frequency, how often a train actually goes by, at average speeds of 30 miles per hour for 15 hours a day of operations. The proposal states there, that there is no subsidy by the public sector in their model and presents it as a profit-making venture where they can sell ticket and raise the ticket prices regularly. The cash flow model ignores an initial required investment of 50 to 65 million by the RTC and any other annual maintenance costs beyond normal wear and tear, which would be borne by the RTC. TIGM's 18 year cash flow model for their investment in revenue assumed they could start building the system immediately. 
without consideration of the time needed to make the required initial structural repairs and track upgrades that TIGM proposes that RTC finance. TIGM neglects the requirement for environmental compliance and project approval, even though they will introduce a new passenger rail system with impacts that have never been evaluated. It also ignores the time needed to negotiate a new agreement with the RTC. They assume they could immediately start upgrading track signals, building stations, acquiring right away, building a passing siding, building and uh, obtaining right away for an operation and maintenance facility, completing testing and commissioning and obtaining all regulatory approvals in two short years. TIGM claims that its approach will save the county many years of efforts and hundreds of millions of dollars, but their proposal for recreational rail is quite different than RTC's locally preferred alternative for commuter rail. As for their technology, the locally preferred alternative assumed electric vehicles similar to TIGM and concluded that the major infrastructure and costs associated with the various electric rail classifications would actually be very similar. Although the TIGM and Roaring Camp demonstration on the rail line was an educational opportunity to learn about recent advancements in rail technology, it really did not provide any information that would make commuter rail easier or less expensive to implement. The TCAA vision of transit on the Santa Cruz branch line is fast, reliable electric rail service from Pajaro Junction to Natural Bridges. The procurement of rolling stock is not needed until a few years prior to testing and commissioning the vehicle on the completed track after at least an initial operating segment is fully funded. Most public agencies prefer and require an open and competitive process for the procurement of rolling stock after clearly defining and funding a rail transit project. If the project was to advance through in the environmental process, it could be appropriate to consider a P3 arrangement at that time with the possibility of a concession type of a relationship for operations and maintenance. Funding for a commuter rail project has always been that project's biggest risk. Chapter eight of the draft transit corridor alternatives analysis business plan documented those risks. Although there is significant state and federal funding available for rail transit, those funds are part of competitive programs that come with guidelines and usually require a minimum local requirement of 20 to 50%. Also, funding programs also often limit the funds to different components of the project, such as construction. Once construction constructed, there are less opportunities for state and federal funds to help subsidize the operation and maintenance costs. Therefore, local funds are absolutely needed to advance the early phases, provide the necessary le leveraging requirements to secure the funding to build the project, and then to subsidize operations and maintenance, even in a potential P3 arrangement. Although there are different mechanisms to generate local revenue, an approximate 30-year half-cent countywide sales tax would be needed to leverage the remaining state and federal funding needed to implement the TCA's locally preferred alternative and then help subsidize its operations and maintenance. There are other funding mechanisms. That's just trying to give you an idea of the scale. A viable P3 relationship requires clear support for a well-defined project, including a strong commitment of public funds. Our potential commuter rail project defined by the TCA study, but the project has not gone through environmental review. Until we have advanced an environmental document and secured the necessary local funding component required to leverage state and federal grant program, a P3 relationship is not really viable for commuter passenger rail. RTC is very active on the rail line targeted by this proposal or the section of the rail line targeted by this proposal north of the boardwalk. Segment seven, phase two of the coastal rail trail between Bay California and the boardwalk will be starting construction next year. We are also getting very close to having full construction clearance on the North Coast Rail Trail segment five. 
with a construction start date dependent on a request to advance the federal funding. Once those rail sections are completed, there could be opportunities for recreational rail proposals, but I would not recommend doing so now in order to avoid potential conflicts with the construction of the rail trail. You should also be aware that the, the sections from Abtonelli Pond to Davenport are out of service, including two bridges and a section of the rail line that is underwater. South of the San Lorenzo River Bridge, we are advancing three EIRs for the coastal rail trail segments nine through 12 from the San Lorenzo River to Rio Del Mar with plans to submit funding grant applications next year. These sections are some of the narrowest sections of right of way with many challenging environmental features. There are sections where track will need to be relocated to fit the trail and the entire width of the rail right of way would be needed for construction. A recreational service in this area would conflict with potential rail trail construction and is not recommended at this time. Therefore, RTC staff does not recommend pursuing this unsolicited proposal or pursuing any other potential P3 proposal for passenger rail service at this time. Staff seeks commissioner and public input regarding this unsolicited proposal, but no action is requested. This completes my report, and um, I hand the microphone back to you, Chair Brown, for commissioner questions. Thank you, Mr. Preston. Okay, so we have um, we now heard a report from our director and I will um, open up for questions from commissioners based again on, on the um, following protocol. We will ask questions uh, right now, then we will take it out to the public for comment. I already see the hands going up. So I think folks have lots to say, um, but we'll ask questions first, then go out to public come back for commissioner comments and deliberations and a motion. Um, if folks are in, uh, willing to, to go that route, just to hopefully to streamline. Okay, um, I see uh, Commissioner Bertrand, you are up first. Yeah, a simple question about the Roaring Camp operation in Watsonville, since this is part of the proposal. Um, how long has this arrangement been going on and do we have any reports from either Progressive or Roaring Camp as to the operation success or lack of success, revenue of potential to keep the tracks running as required by the TCA agreement? So the trip has um, been going on for a few months now. Um, uh, Progressive Rail, um, uh, it still has their contract with RTC. We don't have a contract with Roaring Camp. Um, when they entered into this agreement, um, uh, they did not share a copy of it with us. Um, they chose not to. Um, it's within their right to, uh, to have somebody else um, uh, contract the freight rail service. Um, I haven't heard any complaints about it. Um, I know rail service is down, but I do think some of the decreases may be a result of um, supply so shortages. Um, but um, uh, I do know that um, Progressive Rail, um, you know, has asked for for um, relief on on the ACL, and they feel as if it's an untenable agreement. Okay, Madam Chair, just one more question. Um, in reading uh, TGM's proposal. They mentioned that they were going to do welding of some of the track. Um, I just wanted to know, is this something that is possible with the current track? Because um, I thought it wasn't. And if there's any comments about that, it's a technical question. We may not be able to get the answer right now. There does require us to do upgrades on the track first. And then I believe the additional upgrades that they would like to do are in fact feasible. Um, but like I said, right now, we're going to be going under construction and, and various sections that they've proposed on. And I wouldn't recommend uh, trying to uh, compromise these locations. 
some of the locations, as I mentioned, the track does need to be moved for the for the trail. So it wouldn't be advisable to be, to be doing any sort of repairs on sections of the track where we're we're looking at actually relocating that the track to accommodate the trail. No, I I understand that, Director. Um, it's just the issue of welding these current tracks. And I didn't think that was um, something that is feasible because of the nature of the rail stock itself. And so I'm just trying to get an idea, is this possible? As far as, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Hurst. Uh, thank you very much. My question is, uh, you know, how can we maintain uh, freight operations in Watsonville, and how can we um, promote that? I know that there's a lot of questions uh, regarding uh, passenger transportation on the line, but right now, uh, you know, our business uh, corridor, and and it, uh, it's it got lots of potential. There have been uh, shortages, uh, and that's affected the, uh, you know, the kind of transportation blockages that, that occur, but COVID and, and the seasonal aspects of this hopefully will... Um, you know, change seasons and that, uh, you know, freight can uh, build back up again and, and resume. But I just want to make sure that there's a mechanism in place that uh, potential shippers along the corridor, at least in Watsonville, can get their product in and out. That's the question. So we have that mechanism in place right now. We have an ACL agreement with Progressive Rail. They're the common carrier and they're meeting their obligation to be the common carrier by providing freight service on reasonable demand. They've uh, subcontracted to Roaring Camp and Roaring Camp is um, assisting them. Um, so right now we don't have an issue with that. Um, I believe Progressive Rail is also still helping to market the line to. Um, continue to find new customers to keep it uh, viable there in Watsonville. Thank you. I think we have a tremendous potential uh, yet to be built out there. And so I appreciate the response. Commissioner Rotkin. I just wanted to clarify, uh, as Sandy, at the end of your comment, you said you'll bring it back for our deliberation and action. Uh, I, I believe that uh, our executive director said that there's no, and it says in the agenda, no actions required at this point. So I, I believe we should have full discussion about this. But if we, in fact, agree with the, the, direct, the executive director's uh, comments, which I do, not everybody else may not, I don't know, but if we agree with it, we could simply not take an action at the end of the discussion and this proposal would simply drop away for the time being. Because that's, again, his recommendation is that this is not the right time to approve this. It doesn't require that we turn it down or reject it or, or on the other hand, accept it. Or we could just simply have a discussion about what we think and, and then end that conversation. Am I correct in that understanding? That's, you, that's my question. You are correct, Commissioner Rockin. Thank you for the, the clarification and reminder. It just sort of force of habit. That's the sure, no, we would all do that, <laughs> sure. Um, so yeah, but that, absolutely. So let's just get the questions completed here and we'll take it out to the public and then we can make comments um, if for commissioners who are interested before um, we close the item. Thank you. Okay, um, I have, seeing no further questions, I will um, open it up for public comment. I wanna remind members of the public that the, these are comments directly related to the TIG M Roaring Camp proposal to operate a, um, excursion service on the line as a public-private partnership. We are not discussing um, whether or not to, to have uh, rail service or to not have rail service on the line and our feelings about that. There are plenty of other um, agenda items where that comes up and oral communications, of course. So um, please limit your comments specifically to this proposal. And we will start with uh, Trink Praxel. Thank you, Chair and members of the Commission. Um, I am not necessarily advocating for this particular proposal from TIG-M, but the um, Director's staff report on this raises some issues for me that I think need, I'd like to speak to. Um, 
he has made statements in this report that there's insufficient funding for any rail project and that a half set county sales tax would be essential to obtain state and federal funding for any rail project. This argument is fully inconsistent with the approach to other RTC led projects and with development of any major transportation project. No trans major transportation project has its entire package of project funding identified at the outset. For example, the newly added multi-million dollar Highway 1 project between State Park Drive and Freedom has Measure D highway program funding approved, has only Measure D highway pro program funding approved so far. So the draft TCA business plan um, identified a great majority of likely funding sources for electric rail transfer, which is actually the exception, not the rule for major transportation projects. Um, so to assume that a half cent sales tax is required is incorrect at this point until the draft plan is revised to address accurate cost assumptions for the modern self-propelled streetcars. Um, we do not know if a local share is required, how much that local share would be, and how it would be combined for the options we must pursue. So I urge the commission to direct staff to begin to work on updating the draft business plan to make accurate cost assumptions for an ultralight rail and to begin to explore grant funding and different funding mechanisms to meet the requirements of those grant applications. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up, I see Mark Masidi Miller. Your turn and you're on mute. Good morning, greetings, Chair Brown and commissioners. I'm Mark Masidi Miller, a professional civil engineer and 38 year resident of Santa Cruz. I'm here to follow up on my email sent to y'all yesterday. You know, the one email you read with such keen interest. Seriously, because there are substantial problems with the staff report, I do hope you take the time to carefully consider my written comments. Our current transportation system is a mess. People are suffering from our choked roadways. The planet is moaning and many local businesses are having a tough time retaining workers and attracting customers. Multiple studies have conclusively demonstrated that adding passenger rail will provide significant benefits to our community, especially to the majority Latinx residents of Watsonville who earn just half the per capita income of the majority white residents of Capitola Santa Cruz and Scotts Valley. Instead of simply bashing the recent unsolicited joint proposal from Tig M and Roaring Camp, it would have been helpful to take advantage of the decades of real world experience operating a railroad right here in our county and to more carefully explore how an interim use of the rail line would benefit residents and visitors, reduce traffic, help local businesses and move our community toward a more sustainable, more equitable future. Please focus your energy and our tax dollars on figuring out how we can implement rail transit sooner rather than not at all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'll now call on uh, Mark Johannesson. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Johannesson. I'm an attorney and a resident of Aptos and I'm representing TIGAM. So TIGAM is interested in moving forward now and continuing the dialogue with the RTC and with Progressive Rail in hopes of introducing excursion passenger service on the rail line under the current ACL. We would like to explore the possibility of seasonal passenger excursions in both Santa Cruz and Watsonville using the routes traveled during the demonstration and operations at both ends of the county would be a positive first step. As infrastructure issues are resolved, the service could extend further, connecting the entire line between Watsonville and Santa Cruz. While our previous concept proposals took a bigger view that included commuter service between Watsonville and Santa Cruz, our most recent concept focuses on an excursion passenger service that could be implemented sooner. I wish to clarify to the commissioners that TIGAM is not asking for a vote on our concept proposal, but we are requesting a continued dialogue with RTC to discuss possibilities. I'd also like to clarify a staff comment in the last paragraph on page 19.6 of the report, which states, 
The unsolicited proposal would require Federal Service Transportation Board approval of the termination of the existing ACLO agreement with SPBR, which refers to Progressive Rail. We want to point out that neither STP approval nor termination of the existing ACL would be necessary if a proposed excursion service aligns with Section 2.4 of the ACL, which is Transportation Service and other third party licenses phase two. Progressive, Rail, Pro Progressive Rail's proposal to the RTC named a third party, American Heritage Rail, to handle the passenger portion as requested in the original RP and included in the current ACL. So thank you for the opportunity to comment and would be happy to answer any of your questions going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up is Judy Gittleson. Hi, um, I think this is a tremendous opportunity and it needs to be taken advantage of. And I'm disappointed in the RTC saying it's an unsolicited ask. Thank God for TIG M coming up and saying this is our proposal. The recreational use would get people used to the tracks. We've got the tracks. The tracks need to be the priority. Um, TIGM is an amazing company that's shown us that zero emissions are possible right here. And to squander this in the middle of a global climate crisis and to not utilize what is in front of us is, is you're not doing your job. Your job is to provide transportation. This recreational train could be seen as a beginning to get people onto the tracks. It could be a way to fundraise for the future trail, the train line, and the trail, the tracks have to be the priority. They're in place, and I love the track, the trail, but the tracks are what our assets are. Is there a way that both could be done? Could you put out to bid? Could you ask other vendors to please come up with a solution? TIG M has offered their expertise. They are a California company. This can build our economy and put low, um, it can put light rail in here immediately. It is not an asset to be squandered. And I think you people should rethink what your position is before you let this one go. It may not come back again. And it is a great opportunity for us. And I live in Watsonville. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Kyle Kelly. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Chair Brown, members of the commission and RTC staff. Uh, I was really glad to hear some clarifying comments from Executive Director Preston uh, because I was alarmed at the staff report. On page 19.1, the report says, RTC staff does not recommend pursuing this unsolicited public-private partnership proposal or any other potential public-private partnership uh, proposal for, for passenger rail service. Um, the missing piece there is it's not saying at this time, which is not establishing um, that, you know, there's, there's work to be done, you know, ongoing EIRs, uh, just kind of a blanket statement that ends up removing the possibility of being able to do a public-private partnership. And this blanket rejection of any P3 seems to lack nuance or willingness to consider options and is concerning if we truly share the goal of implementing passenger rail service on our line. Public-private partnerships are the foundation of any thriving community. All communities need both a strong business sector and highly functioning local governments and intergovernmental agencies, and they need to work together. Local business councils, chambers of commerce, and public-private partnerships, such as the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership, are founded on public-private collaborative principles. Numerous affordable housing projects in our local communities are the result of successful public-private partnerships. In fact, nearly all transportation projects can be seen as public-private partnerships. Airplanes owned and operated by private individuals and businesses use public airports and airspace. Cars, trucks, and other vehicles are privately owned and use public roads. Uh, transportation projects are largely, if not entirely, funded by the tax dollars paid by residents and businesses, making virtually all transportation projects P3s. It seems very short-sighted that the RTC would consider a recommendation refusing to consider any P3 proposal now or in the future. So at the very least, what I'd like to see is the staff recommendation revised to append at this time. Thank you. 
Thank you. So Jessica Evans, your turn. Thank you, commissioners. Um, are you able to hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so I'm actually right now speaking on behalf of Friends of the Rail and Trail. Um, so Friends of the Rail and Trail supports continuing construction of the coastal rail trail alongside the tracks as a top priority. And, um, and we appreciate Mr. Press's focus on protecting that process and on continuing to expedite and move forward with trail planning and construction. Uh, we fully support prioritizing continued trail construction and any rail service planning and construction needs to be coordinated with the ongoing trail planning and construction. Um, with that said, we would respectfully remind you that as part of the purchase agreement for the corridor, the administration coordination and license agreement for the line lists excursion service as our requirement of the operator. Uh, this is to move forward with rail transit. Um, <clears throat> given that the RTC is required to institute recreational service, as part of the terms of the purchase of the corridor uh, to proceed towards public transportation service. Court requests that the commission direct staff to develop a proposal for phased development of electric rail transit on the Santa Cruz branch line. This fuller evaluation of the potential for phased implementation of rail transit could then be used to update the draft business plan. The Tegum and Ryan Camp Railroad's proposal offers the RTC an opportunity to sit down and engage with knowledgeable business people on the passenger rail industry. Um, please continue to consider this. Um, please consider a phased implementation such as is suggested by this proposal. Because, um, you know, we want, to, we want to evaluate all the options we'd like to see RTC staff continue with rail planning um, as they you know, do this really important trail building work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, um, next up, equity and environment. Thank you. Thank you, RTC and Executive Director Preston. Mr. Preston, I do really appreciate your clarifications. That was very helpful. Um, bringing rail service to this community is an important priority, which we voters supported in the majority with Proposition 116. And I agree with Trink, who earlier stated that a half a cent sales tax is not necessarily a given. We are still awaiting approval of the TCAA business plan that would allow the RTC to seek federal, state, and grant funding and clarify costs of repairs and various rail options. This needs to be approved by the RTC so we can move forward with determining real costs and seeking funding. The recent rail demo made clear that some form of rail service is feasible in segments along our branch line. And our community's goal is to implement rail service that extends all the way to Watsonville. Given that currently there are a number of bridges and segments of the rail that require significant repairs, it seems wise to consider implementing service in phases or segments along the line that could serve the portions of the public sooner and with considerations to, as uh, Mr. Preston stated, environmental review and other um, considerations that might be discussed, uh, it seems wise um, that we look further at this. Implementation of rail in phases on our county-owned rail line seems far wiser, more economical, environmentally sound versus waiting decades for an all or nothing implementation of rail. I'm relieved to hear that public-private partnerships would not be summarily dismissed by the staff. We know that PPPs are used extensively in our communities to serve very important roles that improve and amplify our community resources. Caltrain is a large-scale example of a PPP, but in our own community, uh, the Santa Cruz Warriors, Santa Cruz Fiber Optics, and many other cogent examples are available. So a PPP with a rail company such as TIGAM could be a win-win and potentially allow service sooner rather than later. Thank you. Um, Bob Burledge, you are up next. And you are still muted. Yep, there you go. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Chair Brown and fellow commission members. Uh, this is Bob Lodge representing Big Creek Lumber Company. Uh, I want to respect uh, Chair Brown's request to stick to this item. 
uh, but, but because of the staff report and some comments in there, we feel necessary to comment. The Creek Lumber Company has been receiving freight by rail in Watsonville uh, for 50 years, and, and that's without interruption. It's very important to us to be able to get that freight to remain competitive. Um, in the staff report on uh, this item on attachment one as a graph, it, it gives a visual impression that um, a rail freight by freight by rail is down, which is true. But as an executive director, Preston pointed out, it's a temporary thing. It really has to do with um, uh, uh, COVID restrictions nationwide, and there's a there's a very serious uh, supply chain problem nationwide. We, we definitely believe that's going to stop. Uh, next staff report discussed. Uh, interacting with potential carriers, but didn't name them. And it would be good to know who those were so that the freight recipients in Watsonville have an opportunity to interact with that process. And lastly, uh, rail banking. Uh, we have serious concerns about rail banking on the existing lines within Watsonville, concerns that uh, we'd lose the protections associated with the uh, uh, federal um, um, Transportation Board uh, uh, Authority. And um, th that's it. We, we, it's that rail line is very important to our company and we hope that that's retained. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Berlage. Uh, we have next up Joe from Trail Now. And Joe, you are muted. So if you could unmute yourself. Okay, Joe, I'm um, I'm not we're not hearing you, so I'm gonna go ahead and move along to the next uh, speakers. We have Gene Brocklebank and or Michael Lewis. And you are also muted. There you go. Thanks. Okay. Hi. Good morning, commissioners. Thank you. Um, somebody referred to, to this commission earlier as being somehow or other paralyzed. I think they said paralysis. Uh, my feeling is the commission is doing due diligence by by reviewing information and making an informed decision. I don't think you're paralyzed at all. I'm an active environmentalist and have been for 50 years. 40 of those years here in Santa Cruz County. I'm grateful for the excellent, informative, full report given by Executive Director Preston on the recreational train proposed by TIG. I was especially interested to hear Mr. Preston's comment about TIG ignoring the environmental review that is required for all construction and use of our rail corridor. I urge the commission to, at a minimum, make a motion and have a vote to accept the staff report, not just shelve it. This is done in many other jurisdictions, a formal vote to accept this excellent report. And I'm hoping that the commission will do that. Um, gee, I have a few seconds. What else do I wanna say? As an environmentalist, I'm really troubled by the uh, comments about um, what we're going to do or not do in the rail corridor as being either an, an environmental benefit uh, or an environmental cost. I am an environmentalist and I am very, very much in favor of the Yes Greenway proposal for the use of the corridor. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up, Jack Brown. Thank you, uh, Chair Brown and commissioners. Um, I just wanted to applaud Guy Preston for a very honest and thorough report. Um, uh, Public-private partnerships are not a bad thing, as many have mentioned, but this one was just off the chart bad. <laughs> um, we uh, 
are looking at a company that is basically a staff of 25, which is about the same as you'll see at a, at a local Starbucks. Um, it's been around 16 years. It has only produced 10 vehicles. The thing that was most shocking to me, though, is that uh, on their website, if you go to their about page, you'll see that they show nine implementations. They don't really describe them, but they show nine points on the map. Um, studying those, uh, what I, I assume are implementations, two are proof of concepts, one for the San Diego Zoo and one in Las Vegas, so they don't exist anymore. Uh, one was just flat out canceled in Cabo San Lucas for one of the trolleys that they were proposing as the uh, uh, to be used between Davenport and Capitola. And three have been dismantled uh, in San Antonio, Texas at a resort that was just taken out completely, no bird, Dubai, gone, and Zoo High. I don't really think that they were the ones that implemented that one, but due to a lot of uh, costs and safety constraints or issues, uh, that was removed as well. So they only really have three implementations and none of them at the speeds, the distances, or the hours of operation that are required here. Um, the one in Los Angeles at the Grove goes eight miles an hour for two tenths of a mile, eight hours a day. Uh, Aruba, five miles per hour, 1.2 miles, eight hours a day. And Doha, which kind of resembles the uh, demonstrator uh, that ran on natural gas, not on hydrogen, uh, four miles per hour, 1.3 miles for eight hours a day. So I'm glad that we're rejecting this and thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you. Next up, uh, Brad. Hello, this is Brad Wilson with Agron Bioenergy in Watsonville. And uh, I just wanted to make a few comments. I appreciate uh, what the what the commission is, is doing. Um, and we are uh, just very thankful that we're able to get our products as needed into Watsonville from other various parts of the country and back out of there as well. Um, so what we do is, is uh, market biodiesel. And so it looks like Brad cut out on us. Um, we'll see if he, if Mr. Wilson comes back, uh, maybe we can get him back in the queue. Um, next up, Tina Andreata. Good morning. Hello. Um, uh, Caltrans is a public-private partnership. Multiple studies have showed that um, rail trail is uh, the preferred, um, well, it's the TCAA and all the other studies we've done. And I understand that um, the Santa Cruz County's weighted population spends approximately $1 billion a year on vehicle maintenance, insurance, gas, maintenance for roads and streets. And I don't see uh, that this would be a problem implementing uh, either with TIGM or with another uh, light rail service, bringing light rail to our communities. I want to bring uh, uh, point out that this year that the Regional Transportation Commission's fiscal year 2020 and 2021, their final um, uh, report stated nearly one third of Santa Cruz County residents, notably children, the elderly and disabled and low income individuals and families who cannot afford to drive a car do not uh, live in South County. The vast majority, they're low income, they're minority population living in the Southeastern part of the county and around the city of Watsonville. And much of their employment is located in and around the city of Santa Cruz. The demographics, geography, availability of jobs and desirability of Santa Cruz County as a place to call home and visit significantly impact travel in Santa Cruz County and cre creates a variety of challenges. I'm asking that um, the RTC continue moving forward and uh, implement rail trail along the 32-mile uh, coastal rail trail. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Barry Scott. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, like Trink earlier, I wanted to address some of the statements made in the narrative related to this 
uh, item and, and especially uh, hope that uh, our newer alternates and commissioners will, will pay attention to uh, or, or review the TCAA business plan, which seems to include information that is uh, maybe conflicts with what was said in the narrative. Um, this one of the things is estimating the capital cost to 465 million for light rail is premature because we haven't pursued the business plan to find out what the lower cost options are. So it's disappointing to see that. Why would the RTC continue to use worst case cost estimates when more affordable options exist? Another, uh, it's been spoken to before, staff does not recommend pursuing this unsolicited, well, this unsolicited public private partnership. That may be fine, but hopefully you wouldn't take public private partnership possibilities off the table as they are included in the TCAA business plan as a potential form of governance. Uh, as others have said, a lot of transportation projects, including all airlines, are public-private partnerships. So let's make sure we keep that on the table. Let's not take anything off the table. Um, I hope, and I'm, I'm kind of disappointed this year in, in what seems to have been a change in direction of the RTC that went from <sighs> supporting rail transit with trail to suddenly putting the brakes on. We've spent Measure D funds on two studies that increasingly conclude that rail transit is what we need to do. And all of a sudden in April, we, we reach a 6-6 tie. How disappointing. Um, we need to come back to the, the business plan. Uh, we need to engage any company interested in providing any kind of service here. So I, I hope that nobody, that no action is taken on this item, but maybe uh, ask to again for more information if you have questions. Thank you. Next up, uh, Sally Arnold. Hi, am I unmuted? You are. Okay, great. Um, well, I just want to say um, that I don't really want to speak about the specifics of this particular proposal or this particular provider, but more about um, some of the generalizations that were made in the staff report. I'm actually very relieved to hear in Mr. Preston's verbal comments uh, that he really clarified that um, he, he's not blanketly rejecting all P3s, you know, a lot, it's just the whole presentation felt a little more nuanced than as I read the, the written version. So that was really uh, heartening. And I was also um, interested to hear his points of, about, you know, we need to finish trail construction on those areas before we can implement rail and that there was a lot of things that needed to happen before we could implement rail. Um, on those sections. And those points are well taken. And I wonder if perhaps while we're doing that trail construction between Capitol and Davenport, um, just continued conversations could happen with this provider who's obviously very interested in serving our community and other providers. And work could be done as was alluded to in previous speakers about getting more information about funding, drilling down on some of the details of what's needed so that when the, tra when the trail is completed, we will be in a good position to then implement some kind of um, you know, passenger rail, maybe it's an excursion for, you know, tourist excursion for the time being, as is required by the ACL. Um, and we'd be in good shape to do that at that point. Um, I really just would hate to see us make sweeping generalizations about we never will do a phased implementation or we're never going to do a 3P3 or, you know, there's like a lot of possibilities here. And I hope that the commissioners will continue to talk with various providers about what those things might look like in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up, David Van Brink. Uh, hello. Hi. So uh, if, if this were a live meeting, I would just be giving a uh, thumbs up from the back of the auditorium. But in this format, I'll ritualistically and formally state, you know, thank you, Executive Director Preston, for your clarifying remarks about the P3 proposal and why eh, maybe the timing isn't right at this time. Uh, that position makes great sense for now, and the upcoming trail construction is super exciting. So thanks. Thank you. Okay, Brad, you're up, I believe. Um, this is you, Mr. Wilson. Sorry, we lost you. You're you're up. Yes, am I working this time? You are. Okay, well, you just want me to start from scratch? I don't know how much you heard. Yeah, you broke up pretty quickly, so if you could just start sure, over. Sure, sure. Sure. So I'm the president of Agron Bioenergy out of Watsonville. And um, so we market biodiesel. 
And I know, um, you know, a lot of people hear the word diesel and they think, oh, it's, it's a bad thing. Petroleum, um, that's not what, what uh, we are. We're blended with diesel. Um, and actually right now there's a product called renewable diesel that we're blending with and it's, and it's 100% from waste products from animal fat, used cooking oil and those types of things. Um, so uh, we, and I'll agree with Bob, our, uh, volume by rail has been down the last year or so, and, and it never has picked up. Uh, to what we know it can. We've actually just recently shipped a couple rail cars there, and then we're going to be uh, bringing in about six more rail cars next week. And I really think it could be, um, you know, eight to 12 rail cars a month, pretty easy. And it could be double that, um, you know, by quarters two and three of next year. Um, you know, and there may be even a possibility where we would need more, more of a rail spur at the facility. So uh, great things going on with the commission. I appreciate it. Uh, keep your support, please, for where what built the track, and that's industry. And it, it's needed. Watsonville needs it, and the whole state needs it. We need more industry. And for those environmentalists out there that are going for, you know, no emissions, I agree with you, no emissions. But to think everything's going to switch to electric overnight is ridiculous. Um, and we're here to bridge that gap. We're here now. It's very good for health. Um, Mr. Wilson, I think you've broken up again and we are, your time is running short. I, I, think, he, I think he made his main points when we were listening. Carefully. Yeah, I think you did. So I, um, we're going to move on and, um, Sean, you are up. Oh, you're on mute. Thank you. I wonder, I'm wondering if the uh, commission remembers the Vision Santa Cruz County meetings. Um, staff was uh, chosen uh, and um, um, uh, chosen and paid for training. There were uh, months of meetings all across the county. And in every single one of the Vision Santa Cruz County meetings, um, transportation was the top priority. Even when uh, people working in, uh, together in workshops at the meetings uh, were asked to think outside the box and aside, you know, something other than, uh, uh, than traffic and congestion and pollution. Uh, uh, um, traffic was uh, then noted as the, as the top negative trend in the county. Uh, transportation was a higher concern to county residents than crime, housing, illegal drug use, homelessness, accessibility, educational opportunities, employment opportunities, support for farm working families and those working in tourism. Um, pick one, uh, Davenport. Uh, I, think, uh, I think one train every uh, 50 minutes or 60 minutes would do fine for them because their concerns are um, infrastructure and um, support for local businesses. They feel cut off from the rest of uh, North County. And rail was brought up specifically in these meetings. And uh, um, along with protected bike lanes and uh, um, responsibility and protection of the, of the coastal lands, um, they, uh, um, uh, they're looking for their area to be cared for by the county and to have the infrastructure for tourism and to uh, uh, protect their, uh, their local businesses. Those are their top concerns in those meetings. Okay, thank you. With that, it looks like we have uh, completed uh, public comment for, for attendees who were wishing to speak. And so we'll bring it back to the commission for comments uh, um, and discussion and not deliberation and action, um, as I was reminded. Uh, Commissioner McPherson, you're up first. Oh, yeah, thank you. And I, I appreciate all the comments. And uh, I want to thank Tigam and Warren Camp for coming up with uh, both with proactive proposals. I rode the, uh, the light rail demonstration. It was quiet and it was pleasant. Um, and I really, a great deal of thanks to the RTC staff for both uh, this proposal and the private 
prior, uh, uh, prior proposal on the partnership. Um, I think the staff report reflects uh, relevant issues associated with moving forward. And I know we're not taking any kind of action today, uh, but with a private public partnership, um, when it becomes um, financially feasible, and I, I wanna reiterate, and I'm gonna focus on finances. I'm, hope, I'm highly supportive and always have been of making sure we preserve the option of implementing passenger rail. Uh, but we also need to ensure um, that, that the freight service to Wattsville remains, remains viable to serve the businesses that depend on it so greatly. And of course, Roaring Camp needs the access to the publicly owned uh, rail corridor for its excursion passenger rail service. But the bottom line is uh, we are limited to move forward with passenger rail unless it makes financial sense. And that includes the service uh, proposed in this new pitch from TIGM and uh, its partners. Um, we, we really, we got to re realize we don't have 50 to $65 million to repair the existing uh, damage on the line that uh, would be required uh, for any kind of service to be implemented uh, of any sort. And, and funding for passenger rail uh, from federal and state resources requires a match of anywhere from 25 to 50%. Um, and of what, an estimated $470 million, the TCAA estimated that would uh, be required to uh, build rail service. And, and we don't have that either. Uh, so in, unless we're really able or willing to divert a large percentage of our dis discussion or discretionary funds going to other transportation uh, services outside of uh, bike and pedestrian or bus and automobile, um, or we pass another ballot, ballot measure, we really don't have the local funds needed to move forward uh, at this time. I think everybody agrees with that. Um, and when we passed, uh, the voters passed Measure D, they specified where the money would go and 8% uh, of it was approved to repair and maintain the rail line, which amounts to less than $2, $2 million a year, or uh, 1.6. Uh, that's not nearly enough to provide the funds needed to do the required repairs to accept the uh, TIGM proposal or provide the local match for federal and state grants for the TCAA uh, uh, preferred alternative. Um, so we need to honor our Measure D commitments and deliver on all those of uh, the transportation projects that we did uh, promise. Um, and it's a balance of project that benefit a wide cross section of the community. And I said, I also do not believe another ballot measure to provide funds for rail is going to pass anytime soon. Uh, many of our uh, agencies are up to their limit of what they could have to operate a passenger rail service at $25 million a year that's been estimated. Um, and, and state legislation, I believe, would need to pass to address the problem. But I do believe we should continue to look for funding to repair the rail corridor and upgrade segments that can be used for uh, the community sooner than later. But the bottom line is right now and in the foreseeable future, we can only afford to preserve the option of uh, pay, uh, passenger rail, uh, ensure the freight saver service to Watsonville and make sure that uh, Roaring Camp can continue its operations on the public part of the line. Um, again, I, I do appreciate all the input that has been made to this, but uh, we've got to be realistic of what we can um, uh, we can do. Because if we say that we can do a lot with the rail passenger rail service immediately, uh, it's a false promise. End of story. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. I will now turn the floor over to Commissioner Hurst. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, uh, Commissioner McPherson's absolutely right in his support for uh, rail in uh, Watsonville and freight. And uh, we've heard from the, the community and the many needs that are out there for uh, public transportation. I really enjoyed reading the uh, concept proposal. I, I thought, thought it was pretty interesting and, uh, and futuristically uh, focused. I certainly enjoyed uh, writing on the uh, TIG experimental demonstration as well. And it was a demonstration and, and seeing is believing. I was fortunate to uh, go along with uh, Supervisor Manu and, and I was sitting right behind him and could kind of give him some uh, lay of the land as to some of the businesses we were going by in Watsonville and some of their uh, freight needs as well. And he got to see the beautiful view of the slough and the white pelicans and 
you know, even though he's uh, expressed some um, reservations about it, I could tell he was having a good time that day. In fact, he had such a good time. He stayed in Watsonville and had lunch at Jalisco that day. And that's the kind of support we really need in Watsonville <laughs> is business support and um, opportunities to show visitors uh, all the assets that we have. Today may not be the day to, to approve this concept, but I think the concept still needs a consideration. And I would ask for more, uh, more information on this because I think that is a wave of the future. We saw the future a little bit. Seeing is believing. And uh, hey, you know, our job is to move forward and get the community moving. Let's move forward together and have some more study on this see what kind of uh, federal and state grants we might be able to acquire and you know fix the bad spots that need to be fixed and hey let's get moving and please don't leave uh, south county out of this mix thank you very much thank you okay commissioner Schifrin, your turn um i thought there were a couple of people ahead of me but um more than happy to go if you choose on me uh, choose me. Um, well, well, I'm just. Does anybody feel insulted that they're being passed over? Yeah, uh, sorry. <laughs> I, I'm going by the 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 order that the hands are up in my participants feed. And ah, usually, what? So if you're raising your hand, hand, I may have passed over you. So just make sure you wait. Really do that wave if you want to um, get my attention that way. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, I want to thank uh, TGM for their, their proposal. I also want to thank staff for their comments. I also want to appreciate the comments by Commissioner McPherson about the long-term commitment to passenger rail, because I've been concerned about certain recent actions of the commission that might give the impression that the commission is drifting away from its commitment to preserve the rail line for public transportation in the future. Um, some of the, pro as commissioners know, there are proposals before the commission that if implemented would, would re require the ripping up of the tracks. I'm also aware that some commissioners would like to see passenger rail service on the line the day after tomorrow. Um, and there are certainly members of the, of the public who support both positions. Uh, we've heard from them regularly. Um, but as you know, at this time, the commission doesn't have the legal authority to rail bank, which could lead to the removal of the tracks. And it doesn't have the ability, as Commissioner um, McPherson reiterated, and the staff report makes clear, to finance uh, passenger rail service at this time. I think it is important, and I appreciate Commissioner McPherson referring to this, to remember that Measure D was a compromise that required the support by a wide range of interests in, in order for it to pretty narrowly pass. Uh, the commission has supported uh, passenger rail service as part of Measure D and subsequently through the Unified Corridor Study and the TCAA where public transit on the line was the preferred alternative. I agree with staff that the TIGAM and Roaring Camp proposal is not supportable at this time Staff has raised many valid concerns about its feasibility, uh, and I support the re uh, staff recommendation to take no action on the proposal. Nothing, though, prevents the proponents of the proposal from submitting a revised uh, response to what the staff, all the concerns that staff uh, raised, because um, they were pretty overwhelming, and I think they were very relevant. So if the proponents of the proposal think that somehow um, it is possible to do what they're proposing to do in light of uh, the concerns that staff has raised. Nothing prevents them from doing it. I may, I, I, while I disagree with some of the general comments in the staff report, I think many of the concerns raised with the proposal are valid. Given the phase two rehabilitation works completed on the tracks, given the cost, I agree that it's premature to move forward with any rail proposal at this time. Moreover, if the commission reaches the point where it makes sense to consider a proposal, as the executive director says, there needs to be an RFP and the process needs to be an open one. We shouldn't just be responding or approving one proposal. 
to conclude then, I support the staff recommendation, but want to thank the proponents of the proposal for seeking a path to provide public transit on this critical corridor and providing a vision for the future. And I hope that there will be possible interrail rail projects in the not too distant future. Thank you. You're muted, Sandy. Uh, thank you. Commissioner Hernandez, your turn. Um, well, first off, I want to um, echo some of the comments that were made about uh, freight. Uh, you know, some of the folks that spoke earlier are some of our biggest employers here in town. And I know that some of them employ uh, beyond Watsonville in North County, uh, Santa Cruz, uh, within Santa Cruz city limits as well. Um, so, you know, I think that it's uh, imperative that we maintain in uh, freight, but also that we, uh, that we look into if, if there's a, you know, I'm not sure if there, if freight was uh, overlooked in the report or downplayed or not, but it's important that we look at uh, a possible uptick in freight uh, as this uh, pandemic plays out. Uh, and hopefully we can get back to pre-pandemic levels uh, in the near future and maybe even, you know, surpass them uh, in the future as well. So I just wanted to ask if there's a, if we're looking for that uh, in terms of being ready for, for freight to surpass, you know, pre-pandemic levels in the near future, uh, if that's in the works. Uh, in terms of the public passenger rail and the TIGM, you know, I hope that we stay open and continue to at least look for new um, funding sources, revenue sources, funding mechanisms, uh, so that we can look for uh, public passenger rail in, in the near future. Um, and then that pretty much concludes my comments. Thank you, Commissioner Hernandez. Commissioner Bertrand, your turn. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, I asked questions about the um, servicing of the rail service in Watsonville. It's been a major concern of mine since Progressive first came to us with their enthusiasm to provide viable um, commercial service in Watsonville. And um, so I'm still asking the questions because I'm a little more concerned now when I read Progressive saying that um, they want to back out of the agreement and they wanted to find, according to the letter, someone that was a little bit more familiar with the territory here. And so I hope that we have better communication with Progressive about what's happening with Watsonville in terms of commercial service and with uh, Big Trees also, um, even though it's a private agreement with them and progressive. I, I think we need to do a lot more to make sure this uh, commercial service is provided. Um, it does um, the provision of jobs for Watsonville. As we found out from the biodiesel company, they imagine and hope for increased business. Um, I did my MBA report, business report on biofuel, and I think it is an important option. I think the president understands that it's a bridge technology and it's also quite clean in many respects. So um, that's just one example. And then providing lumber service to our local lumber provider. There's probably many other options for a company that is truly focused on Watsonville and wants to provide that commercial service. Um, I also would like to reiterate with um, uh, the comments on the financial issues. Uh, several commissioners talk about this. Uh, Bruce was the lead off on this. And I think having the money provides the possibility. And right now we clearly do not have to provide uh, the possibilities to improve our line, to uh, uh, rebuild the trestles, uh, put embankments in place. I mean, there's a whole slew of things that we all are aware of. And so the possibility of uh, the line uh, being used as um, TIGM is talking about, it's just not there. And to that end, um, it shows to me that they haven't done their homework. 
They, they do not understand what our rail uh, can provide, our rail corridor can provide at this time. It sort of, to me, harkens back to when Progressive first came here. And they were full of enthusiasm. They were talking about the sunlight special and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, I am very happy that um, we have an executive director here who is going step by step, providing what he can with the resources he can. We're going ahead with the trail starting up the north and coming down south as the different segments get into planning stage. This is the kind of approach that we need to support. And this is the kind of approach that will in the future provide possibilities for a rail service that could provide um, the movement of people. But we're not there yet. When we get there, I want that process to be an open-ended process where different providers of the service can be given an equal sense that they are going to be considered properly. And to that extent, I am glad that TIGM came here because the public now has a sense of what this may mean. So a, a corridor service with that kind of um, electric option, I think has some viability. But the public now has a chance to say, hmm, do I want to pay an extra sales tax to make that worthwhile in Santa Cruz County? So those are the end of my uh, comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Koenig. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you Chair. Um, I just wanted to start by sharing a little bit of my own experience. I did have the opportunity to ride the trolley in Watsonville with Commissioners Hurst and Caput. Uh, it is certainly a beautiful area down there. Um, and I thought, yes, the vehicle itself it was quite beautiful as well. Um, but what it highlighted for me was really just the, just what poor shape our tracks are in. You know, the vehicle was not able to go more than 10 miles an hour. Uh, it, was, it was a very slow ride and it really rocked back and forth quite a bit. Um, and you could hear the ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk of, of those non-welded tracks. So, you know, when our executive director toss, talks about the 50 to $60 million that would be needed just uh, in repairs to the tracks, even to have a basic operations for this uh, tourist excursion train, it's very real. And, and it, was, it was palpable in the, in the demonstration. I didn't actually get a chance to ride the trolley in the Live Oak area, but in, in some ways it was useful not to because I got the experience of not being a rider. Um, and I, first I'll say that uh, my office did receive several emails from folks, particularly who live right near some of those intersections about the incessant dinging. Uh, I saw one very amusing uh, or maybe not so amusing ring doorbell recording of uh, the, the trolley going by for about 10 seconds and about two and a half minutes of, of dinging at the intersection and everyone being uh, quite confused about that. Um, so there's definitely some folks who are very frustrated by that. Um, development. And then, um, you know, folks are, always want to talk about how uh, this is going to reduce traffic, but my my experience was quite actually the opposite. On 7th Avenue, the cars were quite backed up uh, every time the trolley passed, and uh, it seemed to increase traffic. Um, and finally, uh, it was interesting just trying to walk around my house. Uh, I was walking uh, in the Schwann Lake area um, between 7th Avenue, and a lot of the folks who were, who were trying to walk along the corridor there um, either couldn't or had to jump out of the way as the trolley went by. So, you know, again, the staff report acknowledges that uh, the area between Capitol and Santa Cruz, where the um, this proposal uh, was for, is, is one of our narrowest sections of the right of way. I, you know, I personally don't believe that rail and trail is possible. It's a, it seems to be a it's actually a fiction when you look at the physical constraints of the area. Um, and if anything, this demonstration really just uh, reinforces that. It was interesting. Was any demonstration in Commissioner Koenig uh, done that? Yeah. Sorry, I know my, I, you lost me there for a second. We did. I wasn't sure if it was me or you, but I think um, yeah. So the, if there was a question right there at the end, if you could restate that. Um, no, no question. Um, I was ju just saying it's interesting that, um, you know, the reason the operator did a demonstration in the Watsonville area was at a request of this commission uh, a couple of years ago. I wonder if they actually would have if, um, if we hadn't requested that, um, because, of course, the proposal doesn't, um, doesn't propose to connect the two areas. 
Um, so, you know, this, this idea that somehow the, a tourist train is going to get us to passenger rail, uh, you know, we've seen two, two operators come in with that proposal and it, it, it hasn't worked, right? I mean, um, Commissioner Bertrand just mentioned the sunshine, sunshine special proposals that Progressive came in talking about. Uh, we had Iowa Pacific that ran the train to Christmas Town. Um, it, neither of those tourist excursion trains ever developed into passenger rail service. And of course, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result is the definition of insanity. There's no reason we should expect a new operator who, if anything, has less experience, right? I mean, some of the public mentioned this operator hasn't run on tracks more than two miles or at more than 10 miles an hour with some of their cars. There's no reason to believe that they would be able they would be able to turn it around and actually produce public transit uh, out of this little excursion train. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll just finish by saying, um, you know, we do have a public transit system. It's Metro. It even runs to Davenport today. Uh, and really the challenges we face at Metro are that it's underfunded and doesn't have enough frequency. Why would we want to move forward with any kind of rail project, demonstration or otherwise, that makes the same mistakes? If anything, we should be consolidating our investments on Metro, getting the frequency, getting adequate investment, and making that public transit system work. So thank you. Uh, also, staff, again, for their very uh, clear report on this. Really appreciate the facts uh, that we all have to move forward with. Thank you. Um, so uh, Commissioner Peterson, you are next. Thank you. Uh, a lot of my thoughts on this have already been mentioned, so I'll just uh, echo that I agree with the reasons uh, previously expressed about why there's no purpose for a vote today and why it's not feasible uh, to expect uh, that, that we will have this kind of rail transit or rail transit in the foreseeable future. Um, I also want to echo what Commissioner Schifrin said about the need for an RFP if we were to do something like this, that we can't just um, take an unsolicited proposal and move forward with it, even if we thought it was a good idea, uh, because you know RFPs are, are put in place so that uh, anyone who may be able to uh, provide such a service would have an opportunity to show us that they could do so and, and uh, at what cost, et cetera. And I think that's also important to consider. And then finally, also echoing uh, what Commissioner uh, Supervisor Koenig mentioned about the condition of the tracks. Um, while I was on uh, I did uh, have an opportunity to ride the trolley, and, and during the time uh, that I was on it, there was uh, one of the staff members from TIGM uh, sitting directly in front of me, and the person that was with me, we had a discussion about why it was only going 10 miles an hour, um, and he asked me, can it go faster than this? And I said, yes, my understanding is it can go up to 50, but it's not right now for the sake of the demo, and the staff member turned around and said, yes, because of the condition of the tracks, we can't go any faster than this right now. So I think that those are all really important points that were already made. Um, that being said, I, I did ride the trolley. I found it to be an interesting experience in a, in a nice little vehicle that I would liken to uh, the experience of riding something like a monorail at a theme park or, or another entertaining experience. Um, and as mentioned, uh, implement, implementation of something like this would be exactly that. It would be entertaining, an entertaining tourist excursion and not a means of connecting North and South County via commuter transit and acknowledging this um, issue of transportation equity, uh, this in and of itself would not um, solve that problem or, or address it really in any way. Um, with that being said, I, I again want to appreciate staff, the staff report, all the time that staff puts into this. I know that they're the experts in this field. Um, and um, uh, Director Preston also for taking the time to uh, go over the staff report with us and his oral reports at, at each of these uh, items on the agenda. I appreciate that that you all take the time to create these detailed reports that continue to educate me and other com uh, commissioners in our efforts to make the best public policy decisions we can with the information available to us. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Quinn, you are up next. I think everyone's hoping I'm last. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Brown and uh, Mr. Preston. That was a great report. I too rode the train and it was fun. Um, but I'd like to make a suggestion that uh, we don't uh, reconsider proposals uh, as uh, Commissioner Peterson said, there needs to be an RFP because uh, the train ride was fun. It met none of the prerequisites and it created a lot of dialogue that consumed a lot of our time. And I would suggest that going forward before we entertain any proposals, 
we have clear criteria that need to be met as a prerequisite. With no barrier to submitting a proposal, I think we open ourselves to further fanciful proposals and we really should have robust criteria, financial trail condition, chronology that need to be met before we entertain uh, uh, any further uh, I, con uh, conversation. I, I'm sure Mr. Preston has numerous other issues on his desk uh, that are incredibly relevant to this county's transportation needs. And frankly, this conversation about the train uh, almost pushes everything else off the docket. So I, I would like to see us bring more dialogue to these, uh, more discipline to these conversations in the future so we can address other pressing issues that I'm sure Mr. Preston would appreciate to be provided. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Rotkin. Thank you. Um, I want to appreciate uh, Executive Director Preston's uh, oral comments. As I think Bruce said at the beginning and Andy Schifrin uh, mentioned as well, it was the emphasis that uh, this proposal was not timely. Uh, it was not in response to a, an appropriate public process, which would be an RFP of some sort. Um, it needs to also follow our ability to actually entertain something like passenger rail service. And this is not a passenger rail service proposal that's in front of us. I, I agree with Robert that I don't want to have our staff feel that they need to get involved in de detailed negotiations, further nego negotiations with uh, TIGAM or uh, other proposers that come in at this point. But I do want to appreciate some stuff that came up in, in Director uh, Preston's comments. First of all, people are often saying, well, the rail maybe is possible 50 years from now, 20 years from now. I want to point out that Director uh, Preston suggested that something like 14 years, no, he wasn't promising it 14 years, but that a, a time, a future scale of about 14 years for thinking about actually uh, uh, implementing passenger service as a possibility. And what that suggests to me is that our pathway forward is working on the trail segments that we're working on, which is appropriate, but also we need to define where uh, it's appropriate for realignment of the rail. There are a couple of places where the rail curvature is too uh, tight and fine at 10 miles an hour, but it wouldn't work at 30 or 50. Um, there actually may be some places where we need some additional right of way to make this actually work if we're gonna have rail and trail in some of these segments. Uh, it, that's why I would have appreciated uh, having passed the, uh, you know, the, the plan for us to sort of look at, uh, you know, where we're going with this, but I'm, that's not the discussion that's in front of us today. The, my, my view is that this demonstration was very helpful. It suggested the kind of technology we have. I hope it will end for all time. The discussions where people are suggesting what we're proposing here is some kind of a freight train and locomotives scale, 15 minute service. That, the TIGAM gives you an idea of what this might look like in the future. That's That itself is very, very helpful. Um, I also think that the, moving this um, this process forward, there may be some opportunities for uh, something like an interim, call it an interim service. If this, uh, if we fix the uh, bridges and so forth, which is, you know, a lot of money, but we don't know that the total cost in the end will be $50 million. You could probably bring this up to class two service level, which would be 30 miles an hour. The train that I rode on, the little trolley, went from Santa Cruz to Capitola faster than you could drive it in a car at 10 miles an hour. And it was a totally smooth and quiet ride. Everybody appreciated that. And I saw most people on the side waving and enjoying the service. But it was clear that there are places where right now it's tight between the rail and where there'd be room for the uh, recreational trail and, and bike and uh, pedestrian trail. So I do think we should be moving forward, looking at issues of where the rail needs some realignment within the corridor to be most effective, that we should be thinking about uh, look, how we can look for additional funding sources it would be, I think, crazy to go out to the public and ask them for a half cent sales tax or even a quarter cent or an eight cent sales tax without some idea of what kind of federal and state money is actually available to us. I mean, we all think there's something out there, but is it enough to really imagine that we're going to, that we could have a match that would make it happen? And it's a little premature to think that it's going to take a 20 to 50 percent match because that's the assumption now when there's not much money available. But that, that's going to change already with the, the federal infrastructure bill and the state rail plan. So I think the idea of making clear that we're talking when we talk about interim trail, it's interim trail for the most part in places where it does not prohibit the future development of rail, that we make clear to the public we are committed to having rail, as Bruce McPherson said, passenger rail. And again, if that's 14 years off, I'm sorry, the people that want it tomorrow afternoon, you, you have to deal with the scale of the project that we're talking about. And if we were to have meaningful passenger rail service from Watsonville to Santa Cruz and back, 
in 14 years, I would be delirious. I think that that's a reasonable time frame. I think people should sort of, uh, we're, we're too used to thinking you can go get whatever you want off the shelf in the supermarket today. You, you have to plan things, you have environmental clearance, there's construction work that needs to happen. And there's, there's a lot of work to be done here. But I, the idea, I, I really appreciated the way uh, Director Preston made his comments orally. I like them better in some ways than the written report, which kind of implied we would never have a P3. And as, as many people said, both who are in favor of it or against it even, you know, we're not ruling out all P3s in the future. It's just, it's not appropriate now. It's not a process that we could possibly uh, concur with. So I think taking no action at this point, if we try and take an action, a motion about it, we'd have to start amending the heck out of it to be clear about what we wanted in the motion and out of the motion. And I pray my colleagues do not do that that we basically you know, don't approve this, drop it at this point with no action, and that our staff not be expected to have detailed conversations with anybody about this level of service before we understand how we're gonna repair the, the capital costs here, the, the, the bridges, the culverts, the other kinds of things along the line. Those are my comments, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rodkin. I see uh, Commissioner Johnson, Randy Johnson has a hand up, go for it. I do, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, um, I want to echo what people are saying about staff, and in particular um, for our executive director, which is an excellent report. I mean, obviously, this is a person who has extensive experience on these types of projects and made, if those who are willing to objectively listen, uh, made some pretty sobering comments and actually a cautionary tale, I think, in terms of what the true prospects are for passenger rail, uh, notwithstanding the optimism shared by uh, some of the proponents. Um, it give, you know, for me, it gives me no pleasure to kind of throw, you know, and I'm sure it's the same for uh, Guy, uh, to throw cold water on all the aspects of, uh, uh, many of the aspects of passenger rail from timing to expense uh, and so forth, but it is a reality. And uh, Bruce McPherson encapsulated it very, very well in terms of, hey, being open to these sorts of things. But one of the problems, you know, we have, you know, um, in the vision part of this, the, if, you, if you remember, the triple bottom line is environment, it's economy, but it's social equity. But those are three legs. And I think we have to, let's be realistic, we have to add a fourth leg, and that's financial, okay? what is financially feasible. And that gets ignored a lot. So, you know, again, this is very sobering in, in many, many ways. And you can talk about grant funding and so forth, but the executive director mentioned a very compelling word and that's competitive. You know, it's not like you sign up and all of a sudden if you get in line first, you're gonna get uh, grant funds from either state or federal notwithstanding any sort of infrastructure bill. What happens is that they compare you to the needs of other entities within the state. And, you know, um, how would Santa Cruz County stack up? My feeling is probably not very well. So uh, moving forward, if people want to think that, uh, you know, that uh, passenger rail and TIG and everything was uh, uh, a view of the, the future, maybe it is. But I think objectively speaking, uh, it showed a lot more of the deficiencies than the possibilities. Um, thank you, Chair. Okay. I believe that uh, all commissioners have had an opportunity to say their piece, <laughs> at least for now. Um, actually, I see um, uh, Commissioner Northcutt, you're, um, I just saw your camera go back on, so I, I don't want to leave you out if you do that. Okay. Um, yeah. Recognizing this is your first meeting, and um, so I, I understand, but I did want to give you a chance to jump in. Um, so I'll, I just want to say a couple of things very, very quickly. Um, I will just say that I agree and appreciate the comments that Commissioner McPherson made, and then were followed up on uh, by Commissioner Schifrin and Commissioner Rodkin uh, about the, um, the interest in uh, preserving the tracks, the interest in a long, you know, long-term and not closing off uh, the possibility for um, 
a passenger rail service. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, when when this any item related to the use of the rail corridor and comes onto our agenda, it, it you know people proponents and opponents latch on to what they want to see in the documentation to prove that um, rail is either um, never going to be feasible and not never going to happen, or we could start tomorrow or, you know, or that we can, we can get this going sooner. And, um, and I appreciate that. <laughs> um, and I appreciate, I want to say, I appreciate Tegem um, and, and Roaring Camp pr proposed putting this forward to us because I think it, you know, it's a bold move. I, you know, it was in conjunction with the demonstration, which I also uh, participated in and enjoyed. I actually could picture myself sitting on the um, a trolley like that and getting some work done and finishing up my reading as I head towards the Capitola City Council Chambers for a an RTC meeting. So, you know, I had a different kind of perspective on what this could could mean um, just based on my own experience. Um, and, and we all had that. And, and I think that um, it certainly did provide us, you know, some some tactile sense, you know, prep you know, material sense of what that what that could be like. And um, I look forward to those continuing conversations um, in the future. And, um, you know, and I appreciated, um, so it was a bold move, I guess I'll just say for Tigam and, and Roaring Camp to, to put this out there, knowing the kinds of conversations that, um, you know, are elicited by, um, by um, discussion of, of what's gonna happen with our, our rail line. Um, and I do hope that those conversations can continue into the future. I appreciated, uh, Director Preston, your uh, laying out uh, what some of the significant challenges are. You know, giving us a, what I would say is a is a realistic view of um, what can be done now. What are the other factors we need to take into consideration? And um, I look forward to those conversations moving forward as well. I um, am going to just leave it there and um, and say that um, I too am, am prepared to take no action, <laughs> um, and that doesn't mean, at least for myself, that I am rejecting the idea that um, uh, some kind of commuter uh, transit service could, um, along you know, using the model that we saw potentially even. Um, could be forthcoming. It is, you know, uh, it is a little bit different than, you know, uh, you know, freight carrier um, uh, or, um, you know, another kind of, you know, larger diesel-based service. Um, I mean, th this is a different technology with different costs, and so, you know, let's let's take that seriously moving forward. Um, okay, that was a little longer than I wanted, but I will close my comments there. And um, I believe that um, we are with that, um, unless anyone has final final words, we no, are no. going to, <laughs> Commissioner Rockin, final words, just a little. <laughs> No, I was like, no, no, no <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. I, I do like to make sure everyone sometimes when I close, somebody says, No, I, you know, I, I didn't get my hand up. So um just making sure and um we will um move on to our next item, which is next meetings. And um that would be the next RTC meeting scheduled for Thursday, December 2nd, 2021 at 9 a.m. A location to be determined at least partially. Um, virtual based upon our conversation today. Good and job, everybody, in the meeting. Thank you. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you.